Okay, so <coughs> yeah, please start. <coughs> okay, so thank you. Um, so in the next uh, 40 minutes, more or less, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk is about uh, ribosome economics. Uh, so that's a catchy title, okay? Uh, what I'm going to say is uh, uh, so some uh, things about the ribosome usage in translations, so particularly re related to initiation and elongation. Uh, so I'm very glad, actually, that Dan had this, uh, this nice uh, uh, talk before me. Uh, this is the outline, so I'm trying to motivate uh, uh, what I'm doing. Then I'll talk about uh, the cost of ribosome usage in, in general, okay? And then uh, from the point of view of the single uh, messenger RNA, so uh, focusing more on uh, ribosome recycling. And uh, well, one um, uh, feature of the messenger RNA that uh, is not, uh, it's been overlooked, I think, in the years, that is the gene length uh, of the message, so the, of the gene. Uh, and then, okay, if I have time, but uh, it's, a pr it's pretty late, and uh, so there might be striking for the canteen, so I might skip this part uh, about uh, uh, the implications of uh, this uh, macroeconomics, uh, so the, the optimization of ribosome usage. So I first start uh, getting interested in translation, which uh, has been often uh, uh, overlooked in, uh, in the past years, uh, but actually it plays an important, really important role in protein synthesis. Actually, you cannot really uh, completely uh, understand uh, uh, protein synthesis just looking at transcriptions. So there are a lot of things uh, that have to be done uh, in uh, translation regulation. So I start getting interested into that, uh, and the motivation for uh, actually this talk uh, is mainly in the uh, ribosomal, uh, so the bacterial growth laws that actually Martin talked about uh, the other day. So here you have uh, the RNA to protein ratio uh, against the growth rate uh, of uh, that's, uh, the experimental points are in E. coli. And uh, you see, so the RNA to protein ratio is uh, often used as a proxy for uh, uh, ribosome abundances. So you see that the growth rate uh, strongly depends in a linear way uh, to the amount of uh, ribosomes that you have. So ribosomes. Uh, uh, and uh, so the cost of ribosomes is uh, supposed to be very important in determining the physiology and the global uh, gene expression machinery. Uh, so, well, I really don't think I have to do a lot of introduction to messenger and translation because uh, we have been, uh, uh, so there have been uh, talks about that. Uh, so I'm going to focus mainly on the initiation part, so the recruitment of the ribosomes and, uh, well, the elongation, so the, how the ribosomes are used during uh, uh, the messenger RNA translation process. And actually, the role of these two parts, initiation and elongation, it's been uh, debated in the literature. And there is uh, evidence uh, uh, that uh, initiation uh, is limiting messenger RNA translations. Like if you put uh, strong secondary <coughs> structures uh, in the 5' UTRs, uh, so for the recruitment of the ribosome, that could uh, strongly limit uh, uh, messenger RNA translation. But uh, there is also evidence that uh, elongation can be limiting, as uh, Dan uh, was saying before. So I'll try to kind of merge uh, different visions uh, and uh, try to study the interplay between initiation and elongation. So what I want to study at the end, the global aim, is try to understand uh, the ribosomal current, but that is the protein production rate for each messenger RNA as a function of all these uh, parameters. And, uh, so as I said, I will focus on uh, the initiation rate, uh, the uh, well, codon dependent elongation rates, uh, and the uh, transcript length. <coughs> so maybe before uh, uh, continuing, I think uh, I should uh, uh, would like to clarify the terms that have been used in the literature. So in the literature, you find uh, a lot of uh, people talk a lot about translation efficiency. Also, Dan uh, was talking about that. And I think he, he said that in the right way. So translation efficiency should uh, something that is related to the ribosomal current, so the protein production rate. Actually, um, uh, many times uh, people use the density of ribosome as a proxy for translation efficiency. So I don't think that is uh, completely correct. You could have a high density, but not a large. Uh, uh, current, uh, so protein production rate. And the other thing, uh, the other thing I would like to talk about is the initiation rate. So um, people often uh, confuse uh, uh, ribosome current, so protein production rate, with initiation rate. Mm? Uh, so maybe, well, it's, it will be clear later on, but for me, the initiation rate is the intrinsic affinity between a ribosome and a messenger RNA, which uh, uh, does not depend uh, on the current, uh, which does not depend on the density. Uh, okay, 
okay, there was something there, okay. Uh, but uh, something there was the, well, the sketch of the TASEP. So what I will do is uh, to use the uh, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process mm, as, a, as a model, as a main uh, background model for what uh, I will show you. And uh, well, Dan already explained a lot on the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. Well, is uh, TASEP for friends, uh, so is uh, exclusion process because the only interaction that you have is actually the exclusion volume. Uh, totally asymmetric because we'll just look at particles that are moving from one side to the other side without uh, uh, with a totally uh, asymmetric process and simple because that that's uh, the exclusion uh, interaction is just the uh, only interaction that we are considering. So that's uh, the phase diagram that uh, Dan uh, just showed and uh, well I did a good job saying that uh, actually we are working uh, in this regime. We are working the in the low density uh, regime. So uh, we'd like to stress again, the initiation rate uh, is uh, the intrinsic uh, um, affinity between the particle, the ribosome, and the messenger RNA. And uh, the current uh, in the steady state will be given by this uh, rate alpha times the probability that uh, you have something that uh, is um, uh, obstructing the, the, the entrance of the thing of the messenger RNA, but these uh, will not depend uh, on, the, um, on the density. So uh, let's, talk, uh, let's talk now about uh, codon bias. And uh, so what uh, is the role of uh, codon bias? What might be the role of codon bias in determining the ribosome cost, so the ribosome usage? Um, so the speed of the ribosome so is, uh, is not homogeneous. Mm? So they might depend on several things. It might depend on uh, tRNA concentrations, uh, secondary structures, uh, uh, well, charge of the amino acid, as uh, uh, Khan uh, was saying the other day. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we can do synonymous sequences. So there exists uh, uh, more than one codon that is translating for the same uh, amino acid. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we can uh, translate a protein with uh, synonymous sequences that uh, will have then a different translation efficiency. And one of the main questions also in molecular biology is, uh, so why there should be a codon bias? What is the utility of this codon bi bias? Does this hide the regulatory mechanism? And uh, there have been some uh, indices, so the codon adaptation index, uh, the tRNA adaptation index, uh, many of these indices. But um, what I think is the problem of those indices is that they don't consider the the configuration, the arrangement of the codons along the chain. They co condensate everything just one number. And uh, as Dan was saying before, actually the configuration along the uh, transcript of the codons uh, might be very important. Uh, so actually, I'll try to answer to the question, is, this, um, is there um, a role in the codon usage in, the, in uh, sequestering uh, ribosomes? So um, what we did uh, a few years ago, was to do genome-wide simulation of the East uh, transcript. Uh, and uh, we started from uh, well, the well-accepted hypothesis that uh, mm, the elongation rates are given by tRNA abundances. And uh, well, then we did some um, uh, small correlation uh, with the wobbles ba base pairing. But uh, so that was uh, well-accepted at the time. And uh, so what can we do for each sequence in the genome is to simulate uh, uh, the current uh, and the mm, ribosome density. The problem is that at the time we didn't have uh, any initiation rate value. So what we did uh, was to plot the current, so protein production rate and densities uh, with varying the initiation rate uh, alpha <coughs> that I was telling you about. Um, so this is, uh, well, what uh, at the end of the day we, we were interested in, so the protein production rate, but uh, at the beginning, in order to get the, the, the physiological current, the physiological protein production rate, we needed to know the initiation rate. So we used some uh, experimental data, and in that case was, uh, well, um, sucrose gradient uh, densities. Uh, in order to get the experimental measure of the density for each transcript, and uh, from that uh, we could infer the initiation rate for each transcript. And that uh, was the first time, as far as I am aware of, that uh, we could estimate uh, transcript-dependent uh, uh, initiation rates. And um, so that, uh, so we gave uh, some estimates. Uh, so we saw that uh, there was a kind of broad distribution of initiation rates. And uh, that really depends uh, on the transcript. 
and uh, the average of uh, this uh, uh, distribution is around uh, about uh, around 0 0.12 per second, which uh, is of the same order of magnitude of the what uh, uh, Stan showed the other day. So it will be around seven ribosomes per minute. Uh, and uh, but uh, as I said before, we're considering the bare initiation rates, not the uh, we were not estimating the current there. And uh, so in this paper, there are uh, many other things like the division in, um, of uh, the transcript in two big, uh, broad categories. Uh, it's smooth genes, uh, so genes that uh, with increasing the initiation rate will show a smooth increase in the density. And uh, so these are uh, the, this, the reason for having something like that is actually the presence of uh, uh, a ramp at the beginning of the gene and the ribosomal genes are uh, in this category. And there were other genes, uh, mainly regulatory proteins, that uh, could have a sharper transition in the density, as also Dan will show with uh, his model. So we estimated an um, initiation rate that was uh, kind of two order of magnitude smaller than, uh, uh, well, elongation rate, uh, so codon elongation rate. And actually, I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about that, uh, but uh, we can uh, get an analytical solution uh, in uh, this regime, and uh, URI is going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. So the important thing is that uh, initiation then is supposed uh, to be one of the limiting factor, not saying the limiting factor, but one of the limiting factor in uh, initiation, in uh, translation. And actually, we can write uh, the initiation rate uh, as like a first order reaction, like a bare uh, constant that uh, this constant will depend on uh, well, the properties of the messenger RNA, like uh, secondary structures, uh, uh, well, the characteristic of the ribosome binding sites of the COSAC sequence, and so far so on, and uh, a concentration of available ribosomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, by writing things in this way, uh, we can actually try to emphasize the role of uh, ribosome competition in the cell. So a few years ago with uh, uh, Philip Grulich and Rosalind Allen, uh, we also did uh, some um, uh, model of multi tasp competing for the same uh, pool, of, uh, pool of particles. And uh, well, I don't think I will have time to talk about uh, the implications of that on uh, uh, bacterial growth loads. Is there a question? No. Uh, <coughs> so the important thing is that the synthesis rate strongly depends on the amount of available ribosomes that are not sequestered. So can we try to understand now the role of codon usage? in uh, sequestering uh, the ribosomes. So thanks to the analytical solution that uh, URI worked on, we could uh, define two different indexes now. So uh, a first index uh, could help us to study the role of the codon choice in regulating ribosome density. So the one thing that uh, you might say uh, is that, OK, each uh, sequence wants to minimize the uh, amount of uh, ribosome that you are using. Mm -hmm. So that is a selection for the ribosome cost. Uh, so the worst anonymous sequence of codons will be the one that carries the highest uh, ribosome density. And the best anonymous sequence uh, of codon will be the one that carries the lowest amount of uh, ribosomes. Then you can, f you can define an index uh, eta rho for the density. Uh, that uh, will be like that. And this index is uh, 1. Uh, if uh, you don't use a lot of ribosome, so the best sequence, and uh, zero if uh, you use, uh, well, a lot of ribosomes. And uh, uh, it's going to be a trade-off. It's going to be a trade-off between uh, the density, so the amount of ribosome th that you're using, and the current, so how many, uh, so the protein production rate. And uh, so one could also wonder if uh, the, um, the transk has been made to maximize the current. And so in this case, you uh, will select uh, for efficient and fast codons. So in this case, the best uh, synonymous sequence would be the one that uh, carries the highest, uh, uh, that has the highest ribosome current. And the worst uh, will be the one with the lowest ribosome current. And again, you can define an index that will be one if uh, the ribosome is, uh, is the current is optimized, so the protein production rate is the highest, or a zero if uh, the protein production rate is uh, low. Uh, so if you take a random sequences, you would expect uh, to have these indices uh, at around uh, 0 0.5. So what we did was to compute these, in the, these indices for all the messenger RNAs in uh, East. And uh, well, that were the distribution that we obtained, both uh, at the uh, kind, yes?
Is it possible that the highest density will not be related to all the codons, uh, will be the slowest one? Uh, uh, because so we, we, we did a simulation in other model, uh, but it's similar, and we found that sometimes uh, a, a coding sequence with the highest density, mm -hmm. actually the first codon are faster, yeah. and the other ones are <laughs> slower. So not all the codons are the slowest ones. No, so actually... Or maybe I didn't understand you, so... No, no. Um, so the, the thing is that these uh, density and current, okay, so the current in particular will depend uh, on the first uh, codons, okay, the, the, the first codons plays a very important role in determining the current, uh, and uh, the densities uh, will depend uh, mainly on the first codons, but also on uh, all the rest uh, of, the, of the sequence. You assume, and you assume that the highest density is related to all the codons are very slow, the slowest? No, no, well, we... It doesn't have to be l like that. Uh, so we okay. have the analytical solution for that, and when we compute so it the... You don't assume it? Okay. I don't assume it. No, 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 no. no. So we base that on uh, the approximation URI is going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, and uh, while well things can be improved, one could do that actually with just simulation, but will be probably a bit longer to do that. One should uh, explore all the possible uh, synonymous configurations. Yeah. <coughs> And um, so the distribution for the current, uh, the index for the current is the yellow here, and is a bit uh, broad, but anyway, it's not picked at uh, around 0 0.5. It's, uh, both of them are picked ar at around the 0 0.7. But uh, the, uh, the distribution for the index, uh, index of the ribosome uh, usage, so the, the, the density, is uh, kind of picked at uh, 0 0.7. So this could actually suggest that uh, codons are selected to minimize uh, uh, ribosome usage. So and then uh, uh, that's the part that uh, I skipped. I can talk you about that over coffee uh, or lunch if you want. So uh, actually, I think uh, there are preliminary results, but I think that the ramp of codons can actually emerge uh, if you are trying to make a evolution of codons and uh, trying to uh, impose uh, this uh, constraint uh, for the density for the current. So. Uh, I think I explained you, I convinced you that uh, so the ribosomal pool is important and the uh, messengers uh, at the global level, they are trying to minimize their, uh, their usage, their cost. So now, what happens at the, at the individual uh, uh, messenger RNA? And uh, I'm going to talk now about uh, the gene length and the, the ribosome recycling. So if uh, ribosomes are that important and limiting in determining translation, so um, in this part, I'm going to show you that uh, the ribosome actually tries to recycle uh, as many uh, uh, ribosomes as possible. So, and actually, that part of work is motivated by this kind of plots. So, this kind of plots have uh, been around since uh, the beginning, so 2003, 2004. There is also Arava that did a similar plot. So, you have uh, the ribosome density measured, uh, well, always uh, with uh, sucrose gradient experiments against uh, the open reading, so the, the length of the gene. And actually, there is no reason why that should happen. So you see that uh, the ribosome density is decreasing as a, as a function of the gene length. Uh, so the, the dots, uh, the small dots, are the experimental points, and uh, the red uh, points are the average, the being the average. So then uh, what I did at the time was to gather uh, all the sucrose gradient uh, ribosome density that I could, and there are unfortunately, there are not many. Uh, and uh, I try to plot that uh, in a log log uh, and uh, superimpose for different organisms. So you, you could see in green and red uh, it's uh, east, uh, then uh, ec uh, cellular lines, and uh, these are data sets, the last uh, three there, and the first uh, two are just individual genes. And uh, so it, it seems that there is a, a kind of, uh, let's say, universal trend for uh, these uh, ribosome the dependence on uh, uh, length and uh, ribosome density. So we wanted to try to understand this a bit more. And uh, well, if you're aware of other sucrose gradient ribosome density, well, just let me know. We're going to add, uh, I'm going to add that uh, to this picture. So <coughs> what uh, uh, was the idea? Well, the idea was that uh, um, so if uh, gene length uh, is going to be important in uh, um, in determining um, in determining ribosome density. So there must be some regulatory <laughs> thing uh, or at the level of initiation or at the level of elongation. Mm? And um, so actually, 
it was uh, uh, hypothesized uh, that it was elongation that was playing a role in determining this uh, uh, ribosome density, but we checked that, uh, and uh, actually we didn't find uh, a very good uh, signature for that. So we tried uh, <coughs> to look for a different explanation, so we tried to focus on uh, initiation. And uh, when we tried to focus on initiation, we had the idea to put uh, well, the, the TASP, so these uh, traffic, unidimensional traffic models, on uh, like a polymer in uh, 3D. And uh, that's actually a bit strange. I think there is only one paper uh, by Tom Chow in 2003 that did something like that. But uh, the TASP is uh, often used uh, to describe the well biological system, but uh, they just consider uh, unstructured unidimensional uh, lattice. Um, so you have always a ribosome moving on uh, the, the messenger RNA. And the ribosome uh, will cover 10 codons. And uh, when, when they get out, they can diffuse. Uh, and with some probability, they can uh, get back uh, to the initiation sites uh, that has some uh, reaction volume uh, of radius A. Uh, so that's what I told you before. So the initiation I can write it as a rate constant times uh, well, concentration of ribosome. But now let's, uh, let's uh, make a very rough approximation. I can try to divide uh, this concentration with a global mean field uh, concentration, C infinity, and uh, the contribution of due to terminating ribosomes. That is going to determine the feedback between the end and the beginning of the chain. And uh, so the important point is that uh, initiation will depend on local concentration of ribosomes. So if this uh, concentration that uh, is the contribution of uh, termination, let's say, uh, is of the same order of uh, uh, the overall ribosome concentration, then OK, you might have uh, an important effect. And actually, that's the case. So if you do adjust uh, uh, back to the envelope estimation, you will find that uh, C infinity and CR are of the same order of magnitude. Uh, so actually, if you want to look at a better way of doing that, uh, well, there we have a preprint now. Uh, in which we study in a more formal way the, the TASEP uh, on, uh, on a polymer uh, and uh, we try to relate uh, uh, how the uh, also not only the trans but also how the polymer is changing according to the when you put uh, the transport uh, on it. But okay, I'm gonna talk about uh, a toy model version of it because I think <coughs> it's simpler to explain and uh, it's enough to, 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 to explain the data actually. Uh, so th you can uh, compute the probability of uh, going back uh, to the uh, to the reaction volume, and uh, so you can write uh, the um, the concentration, the, the the term given by the recycling of ribosomes. Uh, that will be something that is proportional to a constant. This constant depends on uh, well pro properties of the messenger in general, reaction volume uh, A, uh, the current of the driven lattice gas and uh, the end-to-end -end distance. So at the end, uh, if you plug it uh, in there, you will get uh, well the, the initiation rate. That will be like the initiation rate of a long messenger RNA. And that's what uh, it has usually been done. Plus uh, a term that is the recycling term. That will depend uh, on the current, of course, uh, and uh, on the end-to-end -end distance between uh, the two ends of the messenger. And uh, so. I would like to stress that uh, okay, we are only working uh, in this. Uh, uh, so I'm going to just show you the result for the low density regime because, uh, well, <coughs> as we showed before and also Dan showed before, we are working in the low density regime. Okay, the total phase diagram is in the other preprint. <coughs> so we can get the initiation rate uh, as a function of the end-to-end -end distance. And uh, so in principle, if we can compute the initiation rate, uh, then we can calculate the ribosomal density and try to see if it makes sense uh, <coughs> compared to the data. So to compute uh, the initiation rate, uh, also we need to compute the end-to-end -end distance uh, r. So mm, the end-to-end -end distance, uh, well, you can just uh, use a rough uh, polymer model. So it will be kind of square root of the total length uh, of, the, of the lattice. And uh, also, when you put the ribosomes uh, on it, uh, well, the ribosomes are covering uh, uh, 10 codons. So the persistent length uh, of uh, bare messenger RNA is around uh, 1 codon, so you have a factor of 10 of difference when you put uh, ribosomes on it. So the uh, effect of uh, having ribosomes on the messenger RNA you should be kind of stretching uh, uh, or modifying anyway the, the persistent length of the messenger RNA. 
And we can do that uh, in a um, the rough approximation. We can compute uh, an effective uh, persistent length. Mm? So I'm going to use uh, the end-to-end -end distance computed with this effective persistent length. That will depend uh, itself on the amount of ribosome that you have on the chain. But uh, that yep. will also depend on the density <coughs> of uh, ribosomes. That depends on the density of ribosomes. Because if you yes. have low density, then you will have two sections. Yes. Uh, say it again. I didn't so the question Types. is... More like uh, a random coil, and the other that is like the, um, so the one that is covered with the ribosomes. So two types of persistent lens. So if I understand correctly, so uh, the question is on the dependence of the effective persistent length, uh, so the, the density on the effective persistent length. Assuming lens. that you have an effective uh, persistent length that is lo uh, larger, because you have ribosomes that yeah. rigidify the, the yes. polymer, assumes that you have them densely covering the, the um, messenger RNA. While if they're um, not too dense, that you ha then you have segments, some covered by the ribosome and, and some, some are not. that so don't, yes. Some that, so they will, will have some part of the messenger RNA that are covered and some parts of the messenger RNA that are not uh, right, so covered to the messenger. Uh, the can be done with like, um, yes, it can be done, uh, yes, I, I, I completely agree. So. Uh, I think this part uh, can be can be modeled better. Yes, uh, for the at the time we were just interested to see if uh, we can get a, j a behavior that uh, could explain the data, at least uh, qualitatively. So with, it was yes. Um, I wanted to ask if um, <coughs> the ribosome could induce the, a kink, or if there are interactions between them that could you know make the the whole thing loop much more. Uh, For example, if there are some sort of electrostatic interactions between yes, ribosomes. Yes, okay, yes, uh, I don't know. That's possible. I mean, uh, actually, we were talking about with Karna the other day about uh, uh, possible electrostatic uh, interactions between, uh, between ribosomes, but uh, uh, I don't know, yes. I think that's the next uh, step. <coughs> so did I answer your question? Kind of. Well, we can talk about yeah. that later. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, so we can uh, then, uh, so we know how to compute uh, the end-to-end -end distance, R, and uh, it turns it depends on the density, so it will depend on the initiation rate uh, itself, <coughs> and uh, on uh, L. So it depends on the initiation rate uh, because of the density and will change the effective uh, uh, persistent length. And uh, so we can then use uh, uh, this uh, rate uh, to compute the density and uh, try to fit the model to the data. And uh, actually, it works uh, pretty well. There is a good agreement between, uh, well, the theory, uh, that is the gray line with the well, standard error for one parameter, and uh, simulation that are the dots that you don't see there, and, uh, well, the, um, the, the experimental data. And uh, so these are uh, it's the same organism that is uh, in IST, and uh, we can get uh, some uh, estimates for, um, for the bare initiation rate uh, of a very long uh, messenger RNA, and uh, lambda that, is, uh, that will be the parameter that is uh, uh, determining uh, the recycling. So then uh, uh, we also included the drop-off. So there was uh, like uh, one referee when we submitted the work uh, was concerned about the drop-off. So ribosome during translation can uh, randomly leave uh, the, the transcript uh, and go away. And uh, will that be enough uh, to explain uh, this uh, density length dependence? Well, no. Uh, we show that uh, uh, with just the drop off uh, in the physiological regime, uh, you will get something that actually will not uh, uh, decrease a lot. Uh, so the drop off rate is about uh, one ribosome. Uh, um, so it's around of the order of 10 minus 4 uh, codons. Uh, and so it starts becoming important in this uh, regime. So we did some simulations also. We tried to uh, include drop-off uh, in the simulations. And uh, without drop-off, so the solution that I showed you before are the dashed lines there. And uh, with drop-off uh, of the order 10 minus 3 per second, that uh, should be the, um, the physiological uh, observer, experimentally observed drop-off rate, uh, we can uh, get a, well, will be probably a better fit uh, in this uh, long gene uh, regime. So then uh, we also try to include um, messenger RNA circularization. And uh, why that? Well, because uh, 
Well, in bacteria, well, you don't have uh, this effect, but uh, in uh, eukaryotes, uh, um, so we were working on yeast there. So you have the in this interaction between initiation factors and poly A binding proteins. And uh, so there is, a, like you can think uh, of the messenger A being in two states, an open state uh, and a circularized state. Actually, that is a kind of the general accepted picture. But it has to be something dynamic, so, so because uh, the ribosome, when it terminates, interacts with the poly A binding proteins and should open the chain and uh, so far so on. Um, so if you just look at the open state, it's the same model that I showed before. If you look at the circularized state, it's the same model that I showed you before, but with a fixed end-to-end uh, -end distance uh, d. And then you can uh, weight the, the two contribution with the probability of uh, being circularized. So substantially, it's the same model that uh, I get before, but with uh, one more parameter. Uh, and of course, it's going to change uh, the, um, the estimates of the, of the parameters that uh, we did before. But uh, well, it, it should fit uh, the data as well, or maybe even better. And actually, that are the results of the fitting with the now these uh, three parameters, when we also include uh, this energy, interaction energy between the two ends of the, of the messenger RNA. And uh, well, actually, we see no a lot of difference. Uh, well, it's the same model with one more parameter. <coughs> and uh, actually, you can see that the distance, end to end distance, is increasing with the ribosome length and that uh, the probability of uh, circularized that is uh, uh, going down at the open state that is going up with the length uh, of the chain. So uh, we have a, a probably qualitative, but that also pre works pretty well when comparing to the data model that uh, things suggest that there is a an important relation between the transcript length uh, and the uh, messenger RNA uh, and messenger RNA translation. And so, what uh, uh, we wanted to do is uh, uh, try to play around with the model. And um, so, uh, at the beginning, I told you that uh, well, um, ribosome abundances are important in the determining uh, messenger RNA translation. Mm -hmm. So what happens now with the model, we can change uh, uh, ribosome concentrations. So it was uh, the overall uh, uh, mean field concentration that you have, and uh, that I call this infinity. And uh, so if we do that, uh, well, we should uh, see a difference uh, in um, the ribosome density. Mm -hmm. So these are the same plot that I showed before, ribosome density against coding sequence length for different uh, concentration, overall concentration of ribosomes. So that. Uh, the, the line that I showed before that uh, fitted well with the data. And then uh, if you have uh, twice the amount of ribosome, and if you decrease the amount of ribosomes. And uh, well, you can immediately see that uh, longer messenger RNAs are strongly affected by the amount of ribosomes. And uh, short messenger RNAs are well, not very affected about that. And that's, uh, well, uh, you can explain it uh, rather easily. So the short messenger RNAs, they kind of uh, prefer of doing a recycling initiation compared to de novo initiation from the ribosomal pool. So the uh, recycling term is much stronger for short messenger RNAs compared to the long ones. So now, how could we test uh, that? Uh, so the idea is that uh, we could take uh, two different genes of different lengths, one very short gene and uh, a very long gene. And uh, we could take like two reported genes uh, of different lengths. Uh, and uh, we can uh, try to change, uh, so to plot the relative expression. So the relative expression uh, here, it was just the current between uh, these, two, these two reported genes of the short uh, divided by the long. And uh, by changing ribosome concentrations, well, you, should ch you should see a difference in the relative expression between the two genes. Mm -hmm. And um, how can you change a ribosome concentration? Well, that's a bit of a tricky part if you just you just want to change your ribosome concentration. But actually, one can use uh, the uh, bacterial growth laws that are saying that if you change uh, growth rate, so you change medium, you can effectively change or uh, change in the, the um, uh, total ribosome uh, content. So that is uh, uh, the validation of, uh, uh, so the experimental validation of the model is uh, still an uh, ongoing process. So actually, we have designed the, the, the experiment and everything. But yes. No, this is, uh, this is just uh, this is the model. So I have a question uh, related to actually the, the model, the initiation. 
So how how do you model the initiation again? This is was that the previous to uh, talk that you mentioned the the from ribosomal uh, density from this part. Uh? From yes, this, uh, okay. from this part. Yeah, for because the initiation is different also in, in longer genes. Uh, the initiation is less usually less efficient. Yes. Uh, ribosome binding uh, sites or the folding, all this stuff. So how you control for this? How uh, how you control for the fact that the initiation is less efficient? Well in the longer genes, and this may <coughs> affect the, the density of ribosomes also. So uh yes, um, so uh, it's actually an outcome of this model uh, because uh, well, it depends on uh, that substantially in initiation. It depends on the end-to-end -end distance that it turns depend uh, not a easy way on the on the messenger RNA length. So it, if you have longer genes, they will not do recycling that uh, easily, and if you have shorter genes. You can do a recycling. But you again, you consider other aspects of the initiation. I didn't. No, not anything. at all. So okay. The experiment you're performing, you no, I, well, you I will do it. You have I the same initiation at the beginning because this is important. Yes, in the experiment, the the begin the binding site of the ribosome and the folding will be similar. So this will prove the. the I theory. will. Yes, exactly. That's what uh, we want to do. Okay. It's not. Uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, it's not a difficult experiment actually. Just need the time to go to the lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's the yes. Uh, okay. Um, so, and actually, okay, that's a good point in way about the initiation. So, what I show you is the outcome of the model. So, with the initiation dependent uh, initiation rate that depends on the length, we can reproduce the density data. Okay. Then, uh, at the beginning, at the very beginning, I show you some uh, estimates of the initiation starting from the data. <coughs> and actually, I was interested in, uh, in doing this uh, recycling thing because we noticed that. Uh, very large uh, correlation between um, the estimated uh, from data initiation lengths uh, and uh, gene lengths and uh, we could not understand that so and actually the two things uh, they are consistent and um, and uh, there is actually a recent paper I didn't put in the in the references I think it's called uh, it's by Lee and uh, et al by Biggins, uh, Biggins group and they show actually that uh, um, they made a statistical analysis on different uh, organisms, and they showed that was actually one of the main determinants of, of translation is uh, um, gene length, and uh, and then it comes uh, uh, secondary structures and uh, codon uh, um, codon sequences and so forth. So, so I can give you the reference uh, later. On. I forgot to put it in the talk. <coughs> so I uh, just like to wrap up. So. In the first part, I show you that uh, ribosomes are limiting, and they can uh, determine growth, so the physiology of the cell. And then uh, the cell uh, tries to optimize their usage. Mm? It tries to optimize the their usage at the global level, so the codon bias, I think, and uh, uh, at the local uh, uh, single messenger level with the determining initiation. And I think that it's been made mainly, not saying that it's the only determinant but it's been mainly done by uh, gene length and then uh, uh, ribosome binding sites can uh, explain uh, variations uh, for uh, 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 expressions uh, uh, for genes having the same length and uh, so we observe uh, a universality let's say in the length uh, dependence behavior and actually you see I use the sucrose guardian data but you observe the same thing uh, also if you plot uh, ribosome profiling data um, and uh, I hope I convinced you that the recycling might be important in uh, determining uh, this uh, uh, ribosome length dependence, uh, ribosome density. And uh, well, the model can uh, we can study it uh, more formally. And uh, also, we can uh, speculate more on the relative regulatory elements uh, um, effect of uh, transcription length. And uh, well, there are outgoing, uh, ongoing experiments. Uh, well, we kind of started that when we had to stop with some problems. But uh, as I said, I just need the time to go in the lab uh, and uh, do the experiments. And actually, this uh, kind of thing could be probably be useful for uh, kind of synthetic systems that uh, have to work in different uh, conditions, because uh, that will depend mainly on the ribosome abundances. And so with that, uh, well, I would like to well, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank the organizers for uh, having invited me. And uh, well, Mamen and Yurai for the first part uh, of the talk, uh, and uh, Lucas and Alessandro for the, for the first part on the ribosome recycling. So, thanks. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
Okay, one question. I don't know if you're the right person to ask you to, but maybe. maybe uh, so I, w I was wondering, show you showed all the pictures you mentioned and also the speaker before the, uh, the what is it, the confirmation of the messenger RNA. Yeah. Would cooperativity not play an important role in the sense, for example, with uh, this is the start that uh, binding of uh, how do you call it uh, of a ribosome could induce uh, could change the the secondary structure could open up hairpins whatever and then allow the, the next one to bind much more easily. Yeah, I but mean I don't know how to model that. But <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, so I start looking into that, then I kind of stopped. Um, so probably the answer for doing that would be to study a model with uh, like of uh, dynamic defect at the beginning of uh, your sequence. So something that will depend on the occupation by the ribosome, the lattice. And so we did the, this in the bulk, so in the middle, but uh, we still uh, haven't done that on the, on the thing. But yes, that's surely one thing uh, to do. And um, <coughs> not sure about that, but I think uh, um, Salis, uh, the person that developed uh, the RBS calculator, looking to something similar, but uh, I don't remember exactly. Okay, one, one last question. <coughs> Um, just to, um, um, back to the issue of the co codon bias. It seems like you operate under the assumption that the faster you go, the better the better is outcome. But uh, but sometimes it may be useful for the for the production system to slow down actually to allow efficient folding. So the overall uh, outcome of properly folded uh, produce would be actually, uh, but in some circumstances, can be dependent on ability to slow down. Can you comment on that aspect, yes, how, I, how that? I perfectly agree. I mean, uh, I don't think I, di I really did uh, show something. I mean, that's not really one of my assumptions, that uh, if you do things fast, uh, you do things better. So I, I, you probably are referring to the index on all the current. but. Uh, that, that one. So here I was saying, okay, let's try to compare uh, uh, an index uh, about the optimization of the density, that is the blue one, and about the optimization of the current. Actually, uh, I'm not sure too much about the meaning of that uh, part, as you said. Uh, and also, you can see that the, distribu the distribution is broader. So, and uh, I completely agree with you that uh, current, uh, so optimizing the current might not be the best way. So I tried once. Uh, to go in the lab and uh, trying to do synonymous sequences of uh, reported genes. And uh, the result that I got uh, from just expression was completely the opposite of what I would expect. Then I went into the, liter the literature and I found actually that there is a, a good correlation, but in the opposite uh, uh, way about with the uh, uh, gene expression and uh, modified uh, genes. So if you put uh, uh, chi uh, codon adaptation in the gene expression, you see something that uh, goes down. There are a few papers that are doing that. So uh, there might be many different reasons. Uh, so might might be uh, cotransitional folding, might be that agglomeration of uh, proteins, uh, if you are doing that, uh, if you are producing too many proteins. So yes, I completely agree on that. But uh, that's why, actually, probably at the beginning, when I started approaching this problem, I was trying to focus on the current. But now I see things more on the cost of ribosome usage, so on the density. Okay, so let's thank Luca again. <laughs> and recently, based among others on this type of models, how we can use them to, to understand biology, okay? Uh, understand biophysics, understand genome evolution. Okay, so this is the first uh, study, it is still under review. And here we, we try, to try to understand uh, meiosis in uh, yeast, okay? But we try to understand the changes in translation elongation during meiosis, okay? This is the idea. So usually people believe, uh, and it was mentioned in the previous talk, that uh, initi initiation is usually the, the most, uh, usually, okay, no, on average, the most uh, 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 regulatory step, uh, rate limiting step, and usually people, when they talk about translation, they assume, okay, the, the regulation is via initiation, okay? And nobody asks, maybe there is also some kind of regulation over time in the case of elongation. I don't know such a paper. If you know, tell me. 
So we, we tried to, and uh, this uh, study tried to, to study transitional elongation dynamics, okay? And to do it, we wanted to uh, develop a, a, a measure, condition-specific measure of transitional elongation, uh, which is genome-wide. We can uh, infer this elongation for all the genes in a certain condition. So it should be, uh, can be uh, implemented in each condition separately. And again, it should be related only to elongation, okay? Uh, and if we talk about ribosec, I just want to emphasize that ribosec, as is, doesn't answer to all these points because ribosec can be condition specific. And actually, we work with the data of Brau et al. that measured ribosec in many, close to 20 points uh, during meiosis. Okay. However, it is not genome wide. Okay, because. Uh, we have very good coverage only for f I don't know, 20 percent of the genes usually, maybe less. And other genes, sometimes we have no read, read count at all, or maybe three reads, okay? You cannot do anything with this. So with our measure, we can estimate the elongation rate for all, all the genes. So this is an advantage. And uh, actually, ribosec also, it's important to mention, it is not related only to Elongation, it includes many aspects, okay? It, if there are more reads in a certain uh, uh, coding region, it's related to the mRNA levels of uh, the, the gene, okay? It's related to the initiation rate, the, the density of a certain position related to many biases, crazy biases that there are in the data, missing values, and also to traffic jam. If there are, there are more read counts in a certain position, it's related to read count, to, it can, can be related to traffic jams, okay? So eventually, we need to take ribosec and filter from it the elongation rate. How we do it? This is based on the filtering that we suggested uh, a few years ago. So we want to estimate for each codon the typical decoding rate of the codon. Okay, a typical, typical. It means that when there are no traffic jams, no extreme uh, uh, delays due to their phenomena, for example, interaction with the with the nonsense protein. And no biases, etc., etc. So we, we take all the read count for, for a certain codon after normalization. Look at this histogram of read count. If the read count is higher, it means the codon is slower. But as you can see, this histogram has a very thick uh, tail. Okay, there is a, a thick tail here, and we want to filtering filter this tail. Thus, taking the median or the mean will not work. And we show, showed it in a simulation of ribosec that it doesn't work. So what we are doing is uh, describing each of these distribution uh, as a sum of two variables, the normal, normal variable and the exponential variable. This describes the tail, and this is actually a simulation. We show that if there are no traffic, there are no problems, and we simulate ribosec, this is what we should get okay, for each uh, codon. And we try to estimate uh, from this, for each codon, from this uh, distribution, to estimate uh, the two uh, uh, distributions. And from the normal distribution, we want to estimate the mean, okay? And the mean, is, this is the one, that, this is the measure that we work with. And now, for each uh, uh, coding region, we can get uh, some kind of estimation of the elongation rate by, by meaning, generating the mean of all the typical decoding rates of the codons in a certain time points, okay? This is, of course, uh, also approximation, but I think the first approximation of elongation ever, okay? So, which is condition specific. Okay, so this is the, the idea. Eventually, we get for each gene an estimation of the nominal typical uh, elongation rate. Okay, typical when there are no rare event, nominal because we, we filter uh, traffic jams, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this now we can compute it for all the genes because we have a measure for each codon, and and it's related only to transition elongation. Yes. Uh, just a naive question. When you add the exponential and the Gaussian, how do you get the behavior near the origin where, of course, an exponential would have the maximum So value? actually, we assume that this is, this variable is a sum of thus, these two variables. Yeah. And so the, the convolution of the, the, their distribution should, should, should get, get this variable. And now we use maximum likelihood to infer for each. Oh, uh, it's not the sum, it's convolution. Yes. I, convolution. Okay, thank you. And we use maximum likelihood to, to infer the parameters. Okay, okay. got it. Okay, so uh, some results, okay? So that's a brief uh, summary of the results. Uh, they are very interesting. So first, let's see. Uh, Why don't you just use a gamma distribution, I guess? It's 
we can maybe we can use a lot exponential and gamma it will be uh, it can be similar I agree okay uh, this is some kind of uh, filtering engineering uh, not uh, I cannot prove that this is uh, mathematically the best one but I, I we showed by simulation that it give very good correlation simulation of ribosec uh, maybe with gamma it will be also good I'm not sure Okay, so uh, this is the first result. So you, you see here different time points during, during uh, meiosis. For each of them, we, we compute for all the, the codons, the, the typical decoding rates, and we correlate it with the, st uh, the static measure of, of codon bias. Okay, the adaptation index, codon ad uh, adaptation index, people mentioned this in the previous talks. As you can see, the correlation is usually positive. Okay, this is nice, but there are cases that it, it is negative and significant. Okay, it's anaphase 2. Something happened here, okay? They actually, what happened here, the, 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 the slowest codon become faster in this, in this, uh, this uh, uh, points during meiosis. And this is interesting. And, and uh, we'll talk about it soon. And the next uh, uh, discovery that we performed, we actually looked for each, uh, now for each uh, gene, we have the uh, estimation of the allocation uh, rate in many points doing cell cycle, you have a vector, now we can cluster the genes to see, to find the clusters and see that in this cluster are, are meaningful and indeed each, you see here a few clusters that we found and each of them was significantly enriched with very relevant uh, biological processes and this is one interesting cluster that I give you, uh, want to talk about you can see here genes that are in all uh, time points are very uh, in terms of elongation, no efficient, okay, this is the blue. But in this time point, anaphase 2, they are very efficient in term, terms of their elongation. And interestingly, these genes are indeed genes that related to uh, uh, this uh, uh, time point in terms of regulation, okay, uh, anaphase 2. You can, see, uh, you can see here many functions that are very uh, 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 relevant, for example, the s separation of uh, the chromosomes. Um, suggesting that uh, some of the regulation of uh, a cell cycle or meiosis is, is uh, encoded in the elongation, okay? And we can, using elongation, we can find it. it this is interesting and I think uh, new. So we also wanted to estimate the initiation rate. So we do it, did it as people mentioned before, for example, Luca. So now if we have for a certain gene estimation of the elongation rate, as I mentioned before, uh, now we can, uh, based on the, the density of ribosome that we have, actually we need somehow to uh, 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 translate ribosec to density of ribosome and we do it via data of Aravai et al, some kind of function that translates ribosec to density. And now we can search for initiation rate uh, such that uh, given the model and the elongation rate, the density will be as similar as possible to the to the uh, actual measurement of the density, and we get an initiation rate. The problem is that we can estimate initiation rate only for genes that we have enough coverage, okay? Not, not all the genes in the case of elongation, but some of the genes with enough read count. And next, we, we show, we, Renana actually built a network of regulation in this time point based on the literature, and we, sh we found that many genes that are expected to be upregulated according to the literature, also upregulated in the case of elongation, upregulated in the case of uh, initiation of translation, and this is very interesting and can, can t give you half an hour uh, details about this, but uh, we need to continue. Okay, so this, uh, the second uh, um, uh, story is about uh, our uh, recent paper where we tried to estimate the traffic jams of ribosomes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, it will be challenging. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is important. Uh, traffic jams, we, we assume traffic jams in all our, our, our TASEP models, etc. etc. How, how, how frequent uh, do we see traffic jams in ribosec? Actually, people claim that there are no traffic jams in uh, standard condition. And uh, as I mentioned, the main problem is that they, they filter traffic jams. Usually, they look on, on footprints related to only one ribosome, okay, not uh, diasomes like you, you see here, okay. And if you perform ribosec, the first step of ribosec, you know, halting the, ri the ribosome, now diazesting them, and they're not protected by ribosome, and now you do the cross uh, gradient, and you uh, uh, compute the, the ratio between the, this area related to diazome and this area related to monosome, the ratio is around 
0 0.2 uh, something, okay? It means that 1 to 5 of the ribosomes are in uh, traffic jams, and this is an interesting uh, uh, observation. And so we performed an experiment where we also sequence and map this uh, uh, short longer reads related to diasomes. And um, I do not have time, but I just want to mention a few results. So if you look at, uh, uh, for example, the peak, where you see a uh, peak of, of uh, monosomes footprints, you, you will see uh, upstream of it peak of diasome uh, uh, footprints. And if you look at only on monosome footprints, you will not see it. This is why people claim that there are no traffic jams at all. We're, and we are crazy, all the people that <laughs> are working with the TASF are crazy. What are you talking about? No traffic jam. Uh, other result that people mentioned here is the fact that there, there are uh, uh, slow region at the beginning, ramp, etc., etc. This is something that, that we reported a long time ago. And we also found that, that features that affect uh, traffic jams, for example, are the speed the speed of the T-adaptation index, the speed of elongation. This is also something that people mentioned. And we found similar results when we, we simulated all this experiment and found the similar conclusions, okay? I don't have time to talk about this. Uh, I will not talk about this uh, result. I just want to mention to finish with some applications, okay? Because I have a few minutes. So in my lab, we develop uh, an agent that based on these models and other models, we engineered in expression. And what we can do with this uh, uh, agent, we actually also published a few tools that some of you can use, RFM flow model, you can download the tools and simulate uh, movement of ribosomes. There are tools that you can use to engineer genes, etc., etc. And this is actually, <laughs> we were actually thinking about uh, uh, um, generating hardware that simulates <laughs> all the whole cell simulation in an efficient manner because it's time consuming. And, well, this is another project that we are working on. Okay, so, so this is interesting and related to the previous talks. So one uh, synthetic biology algorithm that we suggested is as following. Based on whole cell simulation, let's try to delete traffic jams, okay? People mentioned that traffic jam is, is, is problematic for growth, related to, to growth rate. It's uh, consumed the energy of the cell. Actually, most of the energy of the cell is related to, to translation. So if we can delete traffic jams, maybe we can improve growth rate of, of uh, cells, and this is important from the biotechnological point of view, okay? So we ran whole cell simulation, and then we sell uh, uh, cases like this. This is, of course, uh, only intuition, where there is a slow region far away from the beginning of the coding region, such that, uh, that there, is, there is traffic jam of ribosome upstream of, upstream of this. Okay. Now we introduce a slow region similar in similar uh, uh, rate like this one and related to the previous talks, such that the translation rate will be similar, but there will be less ribosomes sitting on the mRNA and spending an energy of the cell. Okay. And this way, actually, we do not affect the translation rate, but we uh, consume less ribosome that the cell can use this energy to do something else and improve the growth rate. Okay, so this is the idea. And it's related to the ramp that we published a few years ago. And actually, we performed an experiment, uh, introduced silent mutation based on these models uh, in a few genes, and we were able to show that uh, indeed we improved the titer of the, this is statistically significant, we improved the titer of the, of the uh, uh, mutant relative to the white right after a few hours, okay? So this is interesting, a few site mutation seems to improve the growth rate. And this is of course important for biotechnology, for autologous gene expression. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it. These are examples that we improve expression levels with different collaboration with the industry, okay? Meaning that the crazy models can help, okay? It's not only maths on the simulation. Uh, and also we use them for engineering viruses, for example, attenuated vi uh, Zika virus, introducing slow mutation, silent mutation that can decrease the, the efficiency of, of gene expression and thus attenuate the virus, okay? And we can, can also do the opposite. We can improve. It, it seems that evolution is far from the, being optimal, also in cells and in viruses. We can improve the, the, the growth rate and titer of viruses. This is a uh, recent uh, experiment we did uh, with bacteriophas M13, which is used many times for fat display. display. So we took the coding region related to the most expressed protein uh, around the, this is the major code uh, protein around the, 3,000 uh, copies, and based on our model, we improved the, the translation efficiency uh, based on complicated model of competition of TRNAs on codons. 
and we were able to Im improve the the theta of the of the fuzz to be 10 times higher. Okay, to summarize, I started started with describing our different models of flow of molecules, not only TASEP but more complicated models. And we talked about estimating the parameter from the very noisy ribosec data, and this data is important for people that are studying translation that need to understand not only the, the, the general idea of the, of the experiment, but the problem with this experiment. But this is the, the best way today to infer the parameters of the models. And we talked about different discoveries and applications. And I want to finish with thanks to uh, the first authors and my group members and the funding and everything is uh, one on top of the other because of the problems. And thank you. Any question? It's time for one. Thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Um, it, two questions, really. One is you briefly mentioned that during the cell cycle in mitosis, if I remember correctly, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 codon efficiency kind of inverts, right? Which is hard to explain in terms of sequences inflexible really is it does it have any correlation with tRNA synthesis or availability in any way does it so tell us actually that yeah so probably, so probably it's related to the tRNA levels but we don't have measurement of the this is one problem usually people do not it's not trivial to measure tRNA levels and people that use tRNA adaptation index usually they use copy number of tRNA as a proxy of the actual tRNA levels and I don't know a, a study that measured tRNA levels in doing cell cycle. But ma maybe it's uh, but, even amino but acid availability. What right? again? Maybe it's amino acids availability or for uh, tRNA. Yeah, so, okay, so we compared it to, to we tried to, to understand if it is related to amino acid availability using a similar um, estimation of the amino acid instead of the codons to see if, if everything is related to amino acid. And uh, there is a strong correlation, but it's not that everything is amino acid availability. And, so and a second question, maybe more conceptual. You seem to suggest that you can improve uh, the outcome of evolution. Yeah, right? I and it's, um, <laughs> I can understand evolution is imperfect in, in designing big things like yeah. humans or big yeah. animals, but viruses, they have plenty of time to optimize. So how come it's, it, it didn't find the, the optimal suggestion and we humans can... So, yeah, th this, is, this is a very good comment. So, actually, yeah, I was jo a little bit joking when I said it because I'm not sure what is the, the objective function of evolution. It's different than my objective function. I'm looking on, a, for example, this case, an, a virus in a certain uh, uh, condition and try to improve its theta. And then evolution trying to, to improve something else. So, I agree. It's not... <laughs> It's not uh, uh, exactly, uh, it's not a proof that I improve, uh, improve the evolution, but, uh, but I think also in the case of viruses and, uh, and cells and micro microorganisms, this is my feeling, I cannot prove it now. When you try to optimize uh, um, objectives, are very, very non-trivial, and to optimize it, you need to, to introduce many, simultaneously, many um, mutations, not one. You know, evolution, how does evolution work? One mutation, selection, mutation, selection, something like this. If, the, if there is a solution that uh, you get it by introducing 100 mutations in many genes and to improve, for example, traffic genes, the probability that evolution will find this solution in this, uh, you know, uh, the way that uh, it converts to local maxima, it's, I don't know, probably very slow, <laughs> very, very low. And we try, when we try to optimize, we look for this type of uh, changes, okay? Not one mutation like evolution, we try to introduce many mutations altogether to find something else. This is general strategic. Uh, okay, so let's thank Tamir Tuller again. Okay. Next speaker will be Jonathan Schub. Uh, we'll see how it works. Sorry, maybe bef before we start, you wanted to make an announcement, da David? Yeah, oh, at the end? Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start uh, by thanking the organizer, of course, for the invitation, and specifically for Cannes. 
Uh, it's been a long time since we, we've been uh, together in undergrad. So that's my contribution to single particle tracking techniques, where I track these guys. <laughs> you, will, you will probably won't recognize it since the haircut has changed, but uh, that's him. OK. So, so, so we're going to stick on gene expression model, but from a more mathematical point of view, certainly. And I apologize, there won't be so many biology in my talk. But I, I hope so you will still find some interest. Um, so I'm going to, to go back to an old model, probably uh, from Goodwin model, used to explain how different cells can have different attractors in this gene expression landscape, but very toy model. And then uh, we're going to uh, go forward adding stochasticity, but keeping very simple models. OK, so that's a central dogma. And the central dogma, if you don't have regulation by proteins, you can have a single, you only can have a single steady state for your mRNA and protein level. And one way to explain different uh, cell fates, so differentiation and stuff like this, is that gene expression have different attractors in high, of course, very high level dimensions, high dimension uh, patterns. But uh, to keep things simple, you can work with a very low dimensional model as this one. So it's inspired from enzymatic dynamics. And OK, here there are three variables. The mRNA, some, okay, some uh, intermediates that can be this protein, and some effectors that can be linked to this protein. And this effector is going to feedback by regulating maybe fact transcription factors or other stuffs that will, in, in the end, influence the signal of creating new uh, RNA. So in the equation, everything is linear with respect to the variable, except one function here that gives a feedback in terms of number of uh, effectors molecules to the new transcription rate of RNA. Okay. So if you go uh, in a, a bit more detail on how should be these functions, you're going to assume some chemical reactions between effectors and transcription factor or operators, depending on the language. And then you're going to assume some kind of steady state, some kind of separation of scales, and separation of a uh, number of uh, molecules. And you will end up at the end, usually with this kind of function. So of course, the details can vary, obviously, from models to models. But basically, this function has kind of S shapes. So like this one here. So this function has kind of S shape. And it can be either monotonously increasing or decreasing. Okay, so if it's increasing, it's a positive feedback, and if it's decreasing, it's a negative feedback. Okay, this is the main uh, way of, of looking at this model. And so you can work on this three-dimensional uh, deterministic ODE model. So here it's a rescaled version to 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 be easier to analyze. <coughs> and uh, again, everything is linear except this function lambda one which gives me my feedbacks. And uh, you can start to wonder what are the steady state of this uh, system. So on this risk scale version, it's easy to see that all guys has to be equal. OK, x1 has to be equal to x2, has to be equal to x3 at steady state. And then if you look at this first equation, you need to, to align this complicated function with a straight line. And so it's very geometric to see the number of steady states you, you may have. So if the feedback is positive, and depending on the shape exactly of this function, if it's very st uh, steep or if it's more, more or less flat, you may have one to three here uh, crossing of these two of these uh, straight lines and this head shape. And if you have three crossing, you can work a bit on, on it and, and show that you actually have bistability. So you have two different steady states that are stable, attractive, and uh, according to the initial condition, you will end up in one of the two. Okay, and so you can you can build bifurcation diagram. Uh, so you have either mono or bistability, and if in the case of uh, negative feedback, so this S shape is going down, and so it's geometrically easy to see that there will be only single crossing, but this crossing can be either stable or unstable, and if it's unstable, you may have a limit cycle. Okay. So we want to go on these uh, lines of uh, studies, but with a uh, with a stochastic model. So since uh, at least 10 years or, or 20 years, maybe now, uh, it's, it, it's become forbidden to use uh, ODEs to, to deal with gene expression, right? We, we all know it's stochastics. 
And one way to, to keep the model simple, uh, but adding stochasticity, is to deal with this on and off that we already have uh, been seeing a lot in, in, in this conference. And uh, to keep mathematics simple, I, I will deal with continuous variable for number of RNA and number of protein. But actually, all the analysis we've done can be done at, at the discrete level. It's just that the formula are much more complicated. So you, re you replace integrals by sums, and the formula gets a nightmare, but you can still uh, work on it. OK, so, so but I will stick here for the presentation to continuous variable, except, of course, this on and off uh, mechanism. So I have a gene, can be off or can be on and switch. OK? And when it's on, so g equal 1, here in this term, you have something positive. OK? So production of RNA. And all the other one, last before, can be taken as a linear functions, decay, or, or linear production of protein proportional to the number of RNA. OK, so that's, I guess, becoming a, a quite standard model now in, in stochastic gene expression model. And there are various ways, actually, uh, to introduce this feedback. So here I'm showing three of them that potentially could be regulated by the protein. Of course, it's not directly linked to specific biological mechanism. It's just uh, one way of mathematician could introduce feedback. So it can be either in the switching rates that may depend on the protein level. Or the switching rate can be independent of Y, but the initiation rate of mRNA maybe is, is regulated by, by the protein. OK, so it, ideally, we would like to do this bifurcation theory as, as done in, in ODE, right, on this model. Unfortunately, I, I, I think it's very hard. I'm not aware of, of any uh, generic work on this. And uh, one, one trick is to, is to, to reduce the, the model, OK? So we'd like to know, in principle, we'd like to know how many possible stationary states to do some kind of zoology, bifurcation analysis on this model, depending on parameters. But uh, this tends to be very hard on this model, so, so, so we reduce it. And fortunately, this reduction in, is inspired by, by real data and uh, mechanisms in, uh, in, in known in, in, in biology, which is the bursting. So we already heard about this. So the idea is to reduce this uh, on and off uh, mechanisms by assuming that the on states are very short. So you really sh stay in on state in a short time. And then the off states are really long. And at the end, if you do this uh, reduction, you end up with this model. So here I'm writing the infinitesimal generator. Here you have the the associated uh, Fokker-Planck equation or master equation, depending on your background. And I, I'm just going to, to do a numerical simulation, right, uh, to, to be sure everyone understands the model. So a, a simple uh, path, a trajectory of this model. What it's doing, when, when it's off, so when g is, is 0, well, you can only have degradation, which can be, for instance, a linear decay. It can be more complicated, but OK, you just have a degradation. So you follow an ODE, actually x0 equal minus gamma, OK? If it's linear, it's just an exponential decay. And for some times, governed by this lambda for the rate, you're going to make a positive jump. So you do a, dis a discontinuous positive jump, and you start again and again, OK? So there are some random times where you do some jumps, and so on and so forth. So that's a, you can do this with a Gillespie algorithm. That's a, a trajectory of the process, and that's the way we, we analyze this with uh, operators. So to, to, to continue on the parameters, the, the jump times is going to be governed by lambda, and then the jump size here is going to be governed by my h function. So lambda is the infinitesimal rate. So if there is regulation in the rate of bursting, it may depend on x. And it's not that easy, because uh, my x is it's time dependent, so I decrease my number of protein, and my rate is dependent on this number of protein, which evolves in time. So that's behind there is an inhomogeneous Poisson processes because of this x dependence. And then if I do a burst, so uh, this random event, I switch from x to x plus y with a given size governed by a, a probability distribution here, so normalized to 1, and the y is my size of my bursting. So in most standard model, uh, this h is the exponent, an exponential distribution, which is really consistent with lots of experimental data, I think. So the size of the burst are exponentially distributed. And that do not depend, apparently, on the process, on the lo specific location where you start. 
So no matter wh what is the position or the number of protein you have when you do this burst, it will be an exponential, okay? With a parameter that is not dependent on the number of protein. So if, if you think of this, uh, I will speak a bit uh, about the how to reduce this model, but it means that there is no regulation during this bursting event. If the burst size is completely independent of the starting point, it means that there is no regulation mechanisms. So in particular, then there is no post-transcriptional regulation, no, no translational regulation. And we wanted to slightly generalize this. So how, how useful is it for biology? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. But uh, so we wanted to generalize a bit and to, inc to possibly include some regulation mechanisms in the birth size. Okay, so that's what my H is, is a function that pot potentially depends on X. So if I want to include some uh, regulation mechanisms in the translation processes, just that's one way to do it. It's not the only way, of course, but that's one way to do it. Okay, but uh, so we have something quite general and we are looking for a stationary solution to do some bifurcation. So it's, there's two ways to see it. Either you put this time derivative to zero and try to solve the equation. I, I prefer to, to, to solve the adjoint equation. It's, it's uh, calculus are slightly easier for me. So I want to solve this equation for a given class of test function. I don't go into the detail, but if I, if I satisfy this, then my U is indeed a stationary state of, uh, of my Fokker-Planck equation, okay? And unfortunately, even in this reduced model, it seems difficult to solve it. And there is a trick that allows some regulation, but uh, not all kind of regulation. So if you take a very specific kind of regulation, which can be seen as somehow a generalization of the exponential distribution, we're going, we're going to assume that for to, to, to let this uh, B parameter, so which in the case of no regulation is the size of my burst, we're going to let it depend on the position. So somehow while I'm doing this burst, my mean burst size is going to evolve with the x, and which can make me even making bigger or bigger jump, or smaller or smaller jump, depending on how, how this b depends on x, okay? So that's one way to, to generalize the exponential distribution and to, to introduce regulation in the jump size, while keeping uh, the mathematics uh, simple, that is, while you are still able to solve this equation at stationary states, okay? So, <coughs> Maybe I, I don't go into the detail before lunch because it, it's already late, but the trick to, to see that this is the most general stuff probably we can do is, is to write this as the integral of its derivative, right? You have the difference of f at x plus y minus f at x. It is the integral of f prime between x and x plus y, okay? And if you do a little bit of uh, Fubini and, and tricking with the integral, you arrive with this form and uh, you can separate the x and the y dependence here in the h, specifically if you have this particular form of the, of the function. So what exactly does it mean, this, this jump size? It means that the, there, is a, there is a dependence of the size given that you start in x, there is indeed regulation, but in specific ways that the tail of the distribution of the jumps is actually not dependent on the, on, on the way you start. But it's only the tail. It's, it's not, so there is a regulation, but in a very specific way. And that's, that's the way you have to do it. Okay, so we can obtain this function. And we are happy with this because now we can work on, uh, on bifurcation. We can work on this function and s see how many modes it has, if you have a changing of shape, and so on and so forth. So before this, I just mentioned uh, that Okay, that's a stochastic processes. It's not completely obvious that it goes to a stationary state, so maybe you don't really bother with that, but you have basically two mechanisms, one that goes down and, and one that goes up. And maybe it's obvious, but if one of the two mechanisms is too strong, so if you go down too fast, or if you, if you go up too, too fast, then your processes is going to explode in some way, so it's going to leave the space, either by zero or by infinity, and then stationary state doesn't have any meanings. Okay, so in some way, it's, it's exactly what you do in, uh, in failure diffusions when you, you want to introduce specific uh, boundary condition and you want you, you want interested is if there is a steady state or if your Bonian particle goes away actually, um, and it turns out that if you have uh, an explicit candidate, then there is convergence to a steady state if some integrals are finite. So it's it's a uh, it's, it's like working with green function. You have a candidate, okay, that's 
you can see as formal calculus this it's a candidate and if some integrals are finite everything is well defined then you are guaranteed that you have no explosions you're going to stay nicely in your space and you're going to have l1 convergence of your time dependent density towards your steady state okay so so everything is fine I, I just mentioned that this is based on, uh, on, on semi-group theory for get alternatives that say basically if if every states communicate, which, which here is, is given by these jumps, okay, because you can explore the states thanks to these jumps. And if you do not go to zero or go to infinity too fast, then you stay in your positive space and everything is fine. Uh, there can be, so okay, this is the thing, there can be more refined theorem on this, and as they are important because, so you have convergence, but in, in practice, if the convergence is too slow, then you never observe your steady state, right? When you do experiments, you do some, some perturbation, and then you wait uh, one hour or one day, uh, and then you hope that you have a new steady state, right? But then if the convergence is too slow, you, are, you actually have no steady state, you have transient dynamics. And so it's important to, 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 to be able to guarantee exponentially fast convergence towards steady states, and this can be done also in, in these lines, uh, although I'm not showing uh, uh, results here. And uh, okay, so we have this uh, particular shape of uh, functions. The, the exact expression actually do not really matter. But what matters is that yes. So do you know of any um, f f shapes of y where you actually get slow convergence? So uh, good question. Um, I think I have one. It's a very uh, probably not very relevant for biology, but uh, so the idea is uh, at least one mechanism to have slow convergence is when you have a stationary state that do not have proper finite moments. So you, you may have a, a distribution, okay, but then f maybe the second moment or even the first moment is infinite. It means very heavy tail, right? More heavy than exponential, very heavy tail, like a Cauchy distribution or stuff like this. And in this case, it seems, although I'm not able to, to prove it, but it seems in, in, s in numerical simulation, that uh, exponential convergence do not hold. Okay, at, at least that's one scenario. There are probably others. Uh, so to, to guarantee exponential convergence, basically you need uh, the jumps rate to be bounded below and above, or strictly positive and bounded above, and to be Lipschitz. Everything nice. Everything is Lipschitz in X, bounded below, bounded above. Then you can guarantee that you have a convergence. But if if you have this actually bounded below, bounded above then the tail actually is exponential, so it's not so EV tail, okay? So at least that's one generic case, and then... Um, there's a lot of active work on, on exactly proving this uh, time scale of convergence, and uh, not everything is solved, clearly. Um, okay, so if you have your, your stationary state, then you can start to parameterize, so here I'm using this parameterization, so this lambda is my, my S shape as uh, in the deterministic uh, model, so it's either positively increasing or uh, monotonously decreasing, okay? It's an S, and, uh, and I'm using the exponential, standard exponential jump distribution, okay, just to keep si things simple, you can, can do different stuff. And then you can uh, start to trick with uh, one parameter, here is uh, like the maximal jump rate, okay? And as can be expected, as we, you increase uh, the jump rate, or the maximal jump rate, well, you're going to start to, to go from a low uh, density, I mean, to the density that charge low values in X, to density that charges high value in X, okay? And you do this in a special way that for intermediate values, you have a double peak distribution, which you can interpret it as an analogous to the bistability in, in deterministic uh, <laughs> models. You have two modes, two preferred modes, Either your protein level will be there, or either it will be there. And these two distinct regions are preferably charged by the stationary st st distribution. <coughs> so, uh, uh, just one uh, quick uh, specific uh, stuff is, in this kind of model, uh, and it's a bit related also to the low, low expression and high uh, variance. In, th in this kind of model, when, when the jump rate is small, well, you are tendency to be very l low valued, okay? You, you are near zero, like in, in the first plot. And then you can have double peak of special kinds. So you have a, a peak in zero and a peak in a positive value. 
which are slightly different from the deterministic bistability because in, in deterministic uh, ODEs you, you never reach zero actually. So the peak are, or the, the two stationary states are always in, in the positive space. So it's a low value and high value, but non zero. Here you have a kind of another possible peak, which is at x equals zero, which is when, when you are really like in this area, no, barely no jumps, create a peaks in zero, slightly degenerative peak. Okay. Okay, I just uh, wanted to, to mention this. Uh, yeah, sure. So I was wondering also about the bifurcation diagram. Yeah. Is this predicted correctly from, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, you have this, uh, everything is explicit. You can play with the parameter and actually wonder how many maxima you have in uh, this distribution and then draw a bifurcation diagram. And, and this is what you get. So it's funny, it's funny also to, in this particular uh, parameterization, and so in this one, you can uh, compute the derivative of u as a function of u and, and make this factor uh, appearing here. And then this would be an extrema. x would be an extrema if this is zero. And then it's exactly like in the deterministic uh, models. You have to cross this complicated uh, regulation function, my S shape with a straight line, but the straight line is not going from zero. I have this burst uh, parameter, an additional burst parameter actually. Okay, I have my B, and uh, it creates that, uh, something slightly different, but it's still geometric. Uh, the number of crossing will give you the number of extrema of U, and then if you have three extrema, you know there will, there will be uh, at least one or two maxima, depends on, the, on how exactly uh, the, the function are. And then you can start to draw a bifurcation diagram. And here, so thank you for the question, in red is an uh, analogous uh, deterministic bifurcation diagram where if your parameters are inside, it is bistable. And here it's something quite generic probably to, to stochastic model. If you start adding stochasticity, the region where you have bistability or at least bimodality is much more large, okay? So people say that bursting will enforce bimodality and and create new, I mean, create different region of stability, and it will be much easier in a stochastic model to have two different points, two, two different stable states, and than in a deterministic model. But I want uh, to, 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 uh, to attract your attention that these two notions of bistability in deterministic model and stochastic models are actually quite different. And there is not a unique way to, to, to deal with stochastic bifurcation. This is one way to, to, to count the number of modes of the distribution. Here is a sample pass of uh, an ODE, and I have bistability because uh, depending on my initial condition, I end up in a different state space, okay? Different uh, location of my state space. So I have uh, one high value here, one low value, and depending, and I have a, uh, depending on when I start, I end up in a different place. But I won't go, so if I start low, I, I will end up low, and if I start high, I will end up high, and I have no way to switch. Otherwise, it's, it's clear that in a stochastic model, when you have a, a double peak distribution like this, it's always dynamic. So the trajectory always moves, right? It's always a dynamic kind of simulation. So that's another simulation of my model. And I have a low uh, time period when I am low, and I have time period when I'm, I have I'm high valued. But then I constantly switch at a time scale that depends on my parameter. So the time scale can be super large, clearly. So I can be almost stable. But there will always be some probability to switch to go to visit another, uh, another location of my state space. Okay? And uh, it's interesting that in this model, you can actually quantify this switching time, so using first passage time theory. And actually, here we can compute mean first passage time using the same jump size, so slightly gener uh, generalizing the exponential distribution. We can calculate the mean first passage time to go low to high and high to low. And this, these are the formulas. It, you, you don't really matter with the formula, but they are complicated integrals. You can calculate everything. And the only thing I, I wanted to emphasize is that this process is strongly asymmetric. And you can see it in the first passage time uh, formula. So it's definitely not the same way to go high to low. So high to low, you have to, to follow the deterministic drift and hopes that you, you won't have bursting that will keep you high value. Whereas going high to low, you have to wait, uh, you have to wait for a burst that gives you in a high value. Okay? And this is 
two completely different mechanisms that make uh, everything uh, asymmetric. Okay, and then you can also do some kind of uh, parameter analysis in, in this uh, mean uh, first passage time. And interestingly, uh, at least qualitatively, if you, if you fixed the mean of your distribution, the mean of your star, okay, the, the mean of your stationary states, trick, tricking with parameters, you can have a fast switching time or slow switching time. So you will really have, uh, and in a non monotonous way, the mean switching time can increase and then re decrease according to the jump rate. So when I'm increasing the jump rate, I'm decreasing the burst size so that the mean is constant, okay? If not, because I have to keep things constant, so the mean is constant, and it seems that I have a, an optimal jump rate if I want to minimize the switching time, and in other situations, I have an optimized uh, jump rate if I want to maximize the jump times, okay? The switching time. Okay, so probably this can be interesting for, for application, but we haven't uh, pushed forward this uh, Analysis, but I guess it can uh, it can be interesting because it really gives you the time scale of switching from s stable state, right? Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how did actually we reduce this model. So we we started from this on and off and two dimensional ODE. So this is kind of a piecewise deterministic Markov model. You have a switching zero and one, and then you follow the ODE. And if G is zero, you only decay, and G is one, you, you might produce the mRNA. And the standard way to do it is uh, first to assume that the mRNA lifetime is short, which means that this degradation rate is high. Okay, so the mRNA is have a sh in uh, many situations. I'm not claiming it's general, but in many situations, it may have a much shorter lifetime than the protein, and then this time scale separation may be uh, may be valid. And so, in, at least in a heuristic way, if if, if gamma one is high then x has to be equal to, to this g lambda 1 over gamma 1, okay? And if you plug this into the second equation, then you have something that only depends on y. So you get rid of one variable. And then the g variable, you do this uh, time scale also separation of the burst period. If uh, the gene is mostly off, meaning that beta, yes, beta is high, so as soon as you are on, you quickly go back to off, okay? The gene is mostly off, and sometimes they are on, but very fast time scale. Well, this produces the burst, and this gives you this equation at the end, which is a Poisson-driven uh, stochastic differential equation. And the Poisson is exactly the, ta the instant, the stochastic time where the gene went on. And during this time, it, it has uh, the, the probability to produce a given amount of protein, and this amount is my jump, my jump size. And the nice thing is, is doing, uh, while doing this uh, reduction, is that you get a feeling of what is a good value for uh, the, my parameter H here. You get a feeling of what is a good value, a good de density for my jump size. And actually, if there is no regulation in my parameter, uh, so if this lambda 2 is not regulated, neither gamma 1, so there's no regulation in my post-transcriptional process, I end up with an exponential distribution. So that's a general explanation why this exponential pops up in, in data, I guess. But if there is post-transcriptional regulation, so if this lambda 2, so the initiation rate is modulated by some weird mechanisms that you are maybe more aware than me, but if there are regulation, then it's not an exponential distribution. And I'm back to actually the, the formula where, we, where, where I generalize my exponential. So actually, it's, it's, it's funny enough that the generalization we did in the, in the exponential, so having this particular, sorry, maybe, uh, yeah, having this particular form of uh, jump size distribution is exactly the one you obtain when you reduce your model from uh, for the two or three stage to the bursting model. So it, it, it's nice because you have a generic uh, formula that holds for uh, any reduction of this kind of model. So it's, it's still quite generic. Uh, okay, this is what I've been saying. Uh, uh, yeah, it's exactly what I said. Okay, <coughs> and uh, I wanted to do a small discussion also. So this reduction are uh, actually technically uh, a bit difficult. It, it, it's not that easy, uh, and I don't want to bother you with the details. But there is, uh, I think, uh, an important fact to keep in mind is that uh, so when you do the when you get rid of uh, sorry of the mRNA of the first variable, it's a, it's a fast variable, and it's a singular perturbation in the sense 
that x is not converging in a nice way as you will expect for time dependent function. It's only converging in uh, LP space, L1 for instance in time, meaning that the value x of t has no meaning anymore. It's, it's a fast variable, it goes too fast, but it doesn't have a value, uh, a meaning anymore, this function. It only have a meaning in a, in a Lebesgue space. Which means that the only thing that matters is that time integral, time average, or stuff like this of my fast variable, but not punctual value of my uh, mRNA. And that's completely speculative, but that's maybe one way to understand why there is a general miscorrelation between protein level and mRNA level. So here is uh, in-house uh, data not really published yet, but we do a differential expression using uh, RNA seq for the mRNA. It's a fold change here in X in, uh, in mRNA, and here is a fold change using a mass spectrometry uh, proteomics experiment. And naively, we were expecting that if there is a positive fold change for the mRNA, the experiment for the proteomics were, was done uh, at the same time point and also two hours later, we were thinking that the positive fold change in mRNA should reflect also a positive fold change for the protein, right? As if you believe the central dogma, when you increase the mRNA, you increase also the protein, right? And this is the kind of plot you get. There's absolutely no correlation, at least at the global level. It doesn't mean that specific gene can be correlated. At least at the global level, there's no correlation at all. And I think this is quite standard in, uh, in omics now, but uh, one way to, 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 to have a theoretical explanation on this is that they are different, completely different time scale. And if we, would, we wish to correlate mRNA and protein, we should correlate time average or sample average of mRNA level, which of course experimentally are much more involved than, uh, than sample point at, at a given time. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll skip that. Um, yeah. So a small recap before going to, to, to a little bit of statistics. Uh, so we did a reduction, so I call it an adiabatic reduction because a slow variable, fast variable of, of a three-dimensional model. We get a reduced model, we could solve it at equilibrium, and we could do a deterministic analogous bifurcation study looking at the mode of the stationary distribution. And this is just a numerical ex uh, simulation of the full model. And the, if you go to the limit of uh, fast variable, you, so the dotted line is uh, predicted uh, asymptotics of the reduced model. And indeed, it agrees with, uh, with the simulation. OK, I, I want to speak a little bit before I'm uh, finishing uh, about how to do the inverse problem. So inverse problem uh, for me is uh, I have an observation of my stationary state. And I want to recover some of the statistics of the burst, uh, which are here. So my uh, lambda jump rate, my gamma is my deterministic drift, and my b or my h is uh, what governs my, uh, my jump size. OK? So if it's called a constitutive gene, so no regulation, uh, lambda is a constant, does not depend on x, and uh, the size of the burst also does not depend on x, and b is a mean burst size. Well, it's stationary state, so there is no way you're going to infer all, all parameters. There is a time scale you do not observing, so clearly you can only observe two of the three parameters at stationary state. So you get rid of gamma by doing time rescaling. And then, uh, so this is well known, huh? it's not uh, for, for my work, but uh, you only using the two first moment of my distribution, I can recover the statistics of uh, the mean and, and then the jump, the jump size. Okay. It's one way to do it. Of course, the uh, time trajectory is also another way to do it. But with a distribution, you can recover it like this. And now uh, I'm wondering also if I have regulation. So to keep things simple, I would forget about the regulation in the jump size. I will only have regulation in my lambda, in my jump rate, okay. just to keep things simple. And I have this formula that uh, relates uh, my stationary state with my parameters. And I can use this formula to infer uh, lambda. So I have an observation of u. I can use it to get my lambda and my b, hopefully. Okay. So in practice, how you do? Uh, in practice, uh, observation of uh, stationary states are quite noisy. So you, 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 you do histogram, of course, but it's quite noisy. And uh, I found a quite uh, nice way to do it is, is to use a kernel density uh, estimation. There are other ways to do it, but so the nice thing with the kernel density estimation is that you're going to regularize your function because you have to estimate derivative. So the histogram can be fine, but then you have to do the derivative of the histogram. 
a derivative on uh, an histogram is uh, it's not well defined, right? So, so it, it can be quite noisy. And so using kernel, kernel density, you convolute your histogram by a smooth function, then everything becomes smooth and uh, it's slightly more rigorous to, to, to compute the, the derivative. But of course there's a lot of issue because you, you have a bandwidth choice with this uh, uh, smooth regularization uh, function and so on. So, so it's not perfect uh, as a solution, but it's one way to do it. So okay, you smooth your, your histogram in, in a way. And then uh, you, you, so you have an estimate of this, okay? So gamma, don't forget about it because you, have, you, you do some time rescaling actually. You, you cannot infer gamma, there's no way. And you have two uh, remaining parameters. And I, wanna, I don't want to do uh, parametric inference. I want to really get the full uh, function without putting parameters in my regulation. Can I ask a silly yeah. question? Of course. I'm sure you won't be silly. 50% chance. <laughs> um, for the burst size of x, yeah. so I understand you know, exponential is a continuous distribution, Poisson is discrete, but um, it seems strange to have exponential distribution, isn't it? I mean, you should have Poisson if you have exponential waiting times between your events. And I think to assume exponential... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so waiting time are completely different from uh, burst size. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. But So the burst size is the number of events within that Short when period. you're active. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. Yeah. So now, if, so right, so now if you're talking about events within that burst, if you're saying that the waiting time between those events is exponential, then you would expect the burst distribution not to be exponential, but to be Poisson. No, 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 it's geometric, actually. So the okay, idea fine, is... Yeah, it's geometric, you're right. But the geometric is actually an exponent. It's a discrete analog of the exponential. So, so I'm, I'm dealing with continuous variables, so I cannot handle a geometric distribution, that's clear. Yeah. If I, well, if I was using the discrete model, I would have a, a geometric distribution for sure. Um, but actually, why geometric? Why not Poisson? Uh, so the process is like this. During a burst, yeah. so it's a fast time scale, huh? but during a burst, yeah. what the MAONA does is that it, uh, the protein, sorry, excuse me. So it increases, so there's one MAONA around, a lot of ribosomes can this, so complicated model, but uh, then you increase your uh, number of protein each time a ribosome completes its stuff until the mRNA gets killed, or degraded, okay? So it's uh, how many success you can do before failure, okay? So you do, you, you try, you try, you try, you try, you try, you produce protein, 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 until you die. And that's typically a geometric, uh, okay? Is that a fair enough explanation? And this, is, this comes from the linearity of, uh, of the assumption on, on these models, uh, sorry. Uh, if everything here is linear, so here is continuous, so it's maybe not that obvious, but the idea is uh, an mRNA produces a protein, uh, uh, the number of protein produced is directly proportional to the number of mRNA. So you can directly uh, have the, the sketch I did with one mRNA. If I have two or three, it's the same picture because they are independent, it's linear, everything is uh, fine. So it's the number of success before, uh, uh, before losing the game, which is directly geometric. Uh, Okay, uh, so I have two parameters, one parameter and one function. And the, the thing I was uh, disappointed, let's say, is that so when there is no regulation, everything is well defined, it's a well posed inverse problem. But actually, uh, here, at least I'm not able to prove that this is well posed, I think it's hill posed. Depending on my B, I, I will have different uh, bursting rates. If I do not, uh, if I do not put restriction on lambda, this is the thing because here you put a lot of restriction on lambda because you assume it's constant, so it makes the inverse problem uh, well posed. If you do not impose uh, restriction on lambda, this is what you get. So you have a, a U star, okay? You observe your U star, you regularize, and then you you, you start guessing what could be B. I put a B value, and then I have my lambda. But if I change, so in black it's the true solution, and it's simulated data, of course. If I change my B, well, I can get a uh, quite different regulated uh, function. So it's a bit disappointing. So don't bother too much with the oscillation here. We are in a state space where, so 12 uh, here, of course, I'm in the tail of my distribution, so I have basically no observation, so, so it's uh, highly noisy. But the disappointing fact is that in the bulk part of the distribution, I can be quite misleading in my, uh, in my estimation of B, okay? So it's kind of, uh, I call it semi-parametric. I don't know if it's the, the standard way to call it, but 
is highly sensitive to the burst mean and uh, you have to know in advance what is the true value of B. So one way to, to get rid of this is uh, <coughs> to impose condition to restrict the, the state space of lambda where you're going to, to look for lambda. And uh, oh, sorry, sorry, before going to this, so you have the wrong uh, lambda and you have the wrong B, but the fit is still good. This is typically a ill post problem. No, the fit is perfect, but you don't have the right, the right parameter, which means non-identifiability, ill post problem. But you cannot distinguish by the fit. Okay, the fit are perfect, uh, but you don't have the right uh, parameter values. So we, we play uh, with uh, real data. So the, the author were kind enough to, to, to send us the data. So I do not claim uh, this is going to be relevant for this synthetic construction. I was just happy to have real data and this particular bimodal weight data because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's funnier than uh, just uh, unimodal data. So we have this synthetic data on this cons particular construction that is supposed to having uh, a positive feedback loop and that can be modu modulated by an external chemical stuff. Uh, so that's why you have different curves depending on the chemical uh, stuff, the number of chemical stuff you put uh, in. So uh, this is the data and the smooth uh, data by uh, the kernel density estimation. And the way we, we solve our ill post problem is you imposed some bounds on lambda and you constrain it to live between a minimum and a, and a, and a maximum value. Okay, five minutes. Okay, uh, we'll be done. So we impose minimal and maximal value. And then we start to, to play with the B. And uh, when you increase or decrease uh, the mean burst size, the lambda, to, to, to be agree with the data, the lambda will we, we like to, to go below or above the mean or the max value, but you, you are not authorizing this, then the fit start, starts to get worse. And uh, what we can uh, plot here is uh, as a function of b, so we, we impose the b, we choose our lambda, but we cut it to, be, to satisfy a constraint, okay? And, uh, and then we, oh sorry, uh, we start to, to compute the distance between the fit and the data. Here we use callback labeler, but can you other distance to <laughs> to 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 quantify the distance between the fit and the data? Okay. And it turns out there is a roughly uh, an optimal B for all the uh, data in this way. And here compared to the s to the smooth version. To of the, the smooth, yeah. yeah. Okay. Kernel density estimate on first, so there is an ex an extra parameter with the bandwidth. I don't know how to deal with, but so, but I'm not speaking about this. Okay, but, uh, okay. Uh, and this is kind then of a maximum likelihood for the B, right? So I'm I'm taking the B that maximizes my likelihood or my minimize my distance between uh, data and uh, simulation, and so it's kind of a maximizing uh, uh, parametric inference for B and uh, uh, non-parametric for lambda. And this is the lambda I get, so it's a bit more noisy than my simulated data, of course. Uh, but generally, okay, so I had uh, 12 uh, different experimental conditions. And if you are optimistic uh, like me, uh, you, you would believe that this is uh, consistent. So you have a single burst rate for different uh, experimental conditions. But the, the burst size could vary a bit, so uh, I'm not explaining this uh, highly stochastic variation between conditions, so of course there is much work to do, but at least that's the starting point to, to, to do it, and uh, we were happy because the burst rate is uh, positively increasing, is uh, monotonously, more or less monotonously increasing with X, which means positive feedback, which was claimed by the author, of course, that they build a positive feedback loop, so we didn't put this in the model, and the inference actually confirms that indeed it's a positive feedback loop. So that's, uh, that's good. And this is the fitting uh, curve, of course, they are quite good. Okay, so small uh, summary. So we had the full solution. We obtained a, a formula to inverse from the density to the parameter. And we could do it in a semi-parametric way. Uh, we did it simulated in real data. It's unfortunately generally ill-posed if you do not restrict the space where you are looking your function. So it's well posed in the non-regulated uh, way because it, it's uh, lots a lot of constraint. And generally, it's ill posed, uh, and you, it's not a problem to get a fit, but the problem is, is to get confidence in your parameter, right? When it's ill posed, 
Uh, okay, and I just want to finish by uh, an extension of this model. We did it in a very crude way, but uh, we can still uh, have an analytical solution in dividing, dividing cells, which may also have some interest for, for cell culture experiments. So the idea is we have a bursting mechanism, the jump, positive jumps, and then a negative jumps with this division. And at division, you share the protein content between the two daughter cells. And then you can keep track of your cell population. And here I'm col coloring code, color code, sorry, uh, red and, and green for high peak and uh, low, low peak. And I still have a bimodal uh, solu uh, solution, which I can compute analytically. And uh, interestingly enough, depending on the switching time, my growing uh, cell population is either completely separated, so one cell line or one part of the lineage is completely green, so low value, and one part is more red, high value, or it's a bit more mixed uh, depending on the actual parameter. Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. Any <coughs> question? Oh, Raoul. So, uh, can you comment on the possible kinetic schemes that can give rise to the generalization of the burst distribution that you mentioned? Yes, 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 uh, of course. Uh, so, okay, I'm here. So, this is a germ distribution you obtain uh, doing the reduction, and I keep track of every single uh, parameter. And uh, the reduction is valid even for uh, protein-dependent coefficient, all of them. So I can imagine a regulation in uh, the off rates. So maybe the more protein I produce, uh, the faster I will uh, go to the off rates or the slower. I don't know. I can ha imagine regulation in the, in the beta. That will produce non-exponential distribution. I can also imagine a regulation in the lambda 2, which is my uh, translation rate. So I'm, I'm producing protein, and maybe, I don't know, traffic jam, or you know more than me, but maybe there are some regulations, and if I produce too much protein, then uh, my mRNA get killed or something. Or, so and then regulation in this. Uh, and I can also imagine regulation in lambda 1, the transcription rate, right, uh, of course. So more or less, you can imagine different uh, schemes. And according to the specific scheme you want to uh, investigate, you would get a specific uh, jump distribution. The nice thing is, uh, whatever you want to put inside, I, we are able to compute the stationary state. This is uh, quite generic, because you still have this uh, generalization of exponential behavior. It's an exponential with a size-dependent or protein-dependent uh, mean. Okay, right. So uh, actually, I'm not aware of anyone that. <laughs> Maybe there are, I'm not maybe up to date to the literature, but I'm not aware of any one using uh, non exponential burst size. But if someone did, please <laughs> tell, tell me, because <laughs> it uh, can be interesting. I mean, if you have a time series of protein arrivals. Yeah, yeah. So you have a, an experimental delta t. You should be able to estimate gamma, right? You said earlier yeah. you could rescale it, but definitely, yeah. gamma is so determinable. I'm, I'm, I'm in the world, I only have a snapshot. But indeed, if you have time series, you can probably solve this uh, ill post problem. So clearly, uh, time series, uh, you could estimate uh, the degradation rate. I'm not too much concerned with the degradation because biologists are kind of able to tune off the machinery, the transcription machinery. And then you observe the, the dilution or the degradation decay, more or less uh, fairly enough. I think there are lots of estimation of different genes of this degradation rate. I'm more concerned with the size of the jump. But again, with time series, you could do a bit of statistics. Uh, look whether it depends on where, where you start or not, and then uh, yeah, with time series, I guess combining time series and snapshot, you could resolve this uh, ill post problem certainly. But uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's an issue of time scale. Probably you need a, a high time series, a long time series enough. And yeah, and the resolution is a problem. For the lambda, I mean. For me, the, uh, the advantage of having a snapshot is that if you have only the time series, I think, uh, I have no proof of this, but I think it's more complicated to infer uh, regulation mechanisms from time series because you are back to the problem. Uh, you need, if you have 
small observation of, of reaching a given level, how are you going to infer the jump rate? And uh, it's, I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's easier to do it on the snapshot. But probably for the jump size, it's a different story. Yeah. OK, let's uh, thank Romain again. Uh, I'll be talking to you primarily about uh, analytical results uh, developed by my group for stochastic models of gene expression. Okay. So let me begin with um, uh, some motivating, a motivating example. So this is an example uh, observation that goes back to 2010 in Jeff Settlement's lab. They were looking at cancer cells and they were looking at the um, survival of cancer cells when exposed to drugs. And what they found was there was a small population of cancer cells that was drug tolerant. They could uh, you know, take hundredfold uh, more higher concentrations of drug and still survive. Uh, but what was interesting was also that uh, this, they expected this population of cancer cells to be a clonal population, genetically identical. Okay? So they uh, examined things further and they found that in fact the, the cells that are drug tolerant are not fixed. With time, with the passage of time, uh, the cells change. So you can see the pink cell. This cell is pink, but later on it becomes uh, again gray. But some other cell becomes pink. So what you have is you have in a given population at a given time a small fraction of cells that survive chemotherapy. But this is a dynamic survival strategy in the sense that individual cells in the population transiently and reversibly uh, move to a drug tolerant phenotype. Okay. Um, and this is very critical because this in fact enables uh, survival of the cancer cells. So if you add drugs to it, uh, you kill off most of the normal cancer cells, uh, but the um, uh, drug tolerant cells survive and they can repopulate the entire population again. Once again, the, the repopulated population on a small time scale is mostly drug sensitive. Okay, so. Um, so one of the big questions this study and other studies after it raised, what are the molecular mechanisms that underlie the switch to a drug tolerant phenotype? Okay. Now this has been studied in many cancers and most recently uh, Arjun Raj group actually took it even further and they showed that the, in fact the effect is more pernicious uh, in the sense that, um, um, so here's an example of a patient suffering with melanoma. And the biggest problem that we have in cancer treatment is that uh, cancers develop drug resistance. Okay? So you see uh, somebody with melanoma, you give them the drugs after uh, some weeks, uh, it's almost as if they are uh, uh, free of uh, any kind of uh, uh, cancer symptoms. Uh, but, uh, but that's misleading because uh, a few more weeks later, some time later, uh, the, the cancer returns uh, and uh, this time it's drug resistant. Okay? So you can't do anything about it. So, um, so what Arjun Raj group did was they looked at uh, this process now uh, at the level of gene expression, both for the population as well as for uh, at the single cell level. And so what they found was that uh, the resistant population has a very different gene expression profile from, so if you looked at the bulk, then the uh, gene expression profile for the resistant population is very different from the gene expression profile of um, uh, the pre-drug resist uh, uh, population. But when they analyzed things at a single cell level, uh, they found some surprises, which is, again, they found the same phenomenon that when you treat with drugs, this is prior to drug treatment, you have a population of cancer cells, you treat with drugs, some cells survive. And these cells, what they found was that continued exposure to drug actually induces reprogramming. So if your standard policy is to keep exposing uh, uh, drug, put as many, um, uh, put as much of the uh, uh, drug as the patient can handle, then that actually has a counterproductive effect because um, uh, the, uh, it induces the remaining cells to actually reprogram into resistant cells. So, so what is different about these cells? Well, uh, when they examined things at the single cell level, what they found was that although the bulk gene expression profiles are very different in these two cases, the green cells out here, which are uh, the resistant, the, the drug tolerant cells in some sense, right? These are the ones whose gene expression profile actually more closely resembles the drug resistant case, okay? But this is prior to drug treatment. So there'll be no treatment by drug and it seems already there's spontaneously some amount of, uh, some fraction of cells who are expressing, which are expressing question. 
So they looked at uh, the entire gene expression profile and they looked, they highlighted about 1000 genes or so which are different between, um, uh, differentially expressed between the resistant and the transient, uh, the uh, initial phase, right, pre drug this. Uh, out of those, um, they then focused on key genes which are known to be important in cancers and those genes, about 70 odd of those are the, 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 trans, the sensitive cells are the ones which have expression of those genes uh, more closely resembling the resistant phase as opposed to the, uh, the bulk uh, cancer phase. Okay? So, um, so clearly uh, what we have is we have some rare events which give rise to, you know, even prior to treatment by drugs, we have some rare events which give rise to some fraction of the population expressing a different gene expression program which is driving this process and we need to understand it better. Okay? So, uh, so one question is how do we characterize these rare events that give rise to the emergence of uh, these cells. Okay? Uh, so some other clues come from uh, again uh, piecing together clues from different cancers uh, from Galit Lahav's uh, lab. So experiments they did, they were trying to focus on what uh, enables differential survival of um, cancer cells when you treat them with drugs. And so they look at this particular case where you add a drug called cisplatin and the way it works um, uh, it seems is that it induces the cell to commit apoptosis mediated via p53. Okay? So, um, but then what they found was uh, there is a fraction of cells that actually do not com uh, commit to apoptosis even when you are treated by drugs. And the mechanism they found was that well uh, there seems to be a moving threshold almost linear and as long as p53 levels exceed that threshold okay, uh, for long enough uh, for some period of time uh, the cell will commit to apoptosis. But if you have a fluctuation by which uh, the rate of accumulation of p53 is much lower than normal then those cells can actually evade apoptosis. Okay? So that was their observation and they figured out some ways of then adjusting the treatment protocol to commit more cells to apoptosis. Uh, but the takeaway for us is that um, it seems that the rate of accumulation of p53 or rate of production of p53 um, is a random variable and that uh, you know can decide cell fate. Okay? So we would like to be able to make some predictions for this the distribution of the rate in some sense. Okay? Okay. So, uh, so this is just an example from cancers, but in fact this story is seen in many domains. So you see it in HIV viral infections, you see in bacterial infections where you have some persisters and uh, then again tolerant cells. And the common theme is that again as we learned in Jonathan's talk, you have um, uh, probabilistic sulfate decisions, uh, individual cells in the population undergo probabilistic sulfate decisions which lead to phenotypic variation. And so clearly the question is what is the underlying source and in many cases as I emphasize this, these are all most cases uh, genetically identical cells in a homogeneous environment. So nature and nurture are the same right roughly but there is a third element that is chance and uh, so one of the answers that is emerging is that it is stochasticity or randomness um, uh, in cellular uh, processes that actually drives this phenotypic variations. Uh, in particular again as uh, was pointed out in uh, Jonathan Chubb's talk, uh, as the variance in gene expression profiles increases, there is an increasing tendency to uh, uh, have a sulfate decision, uh, probabilistic sulfate decision. So, so that is sort of the motivation we want to be able to look at um, models which uh, try to uh, 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 model uh, rare events in gene expression. Uh, and uh, which can then drive variations in isogenic cells. Okay? So that is that's, uh, kind of the processes that we want to model. And so let us begin with the simplest way. So at the simplest level again as we have seen in several talks, uh, gene expression can be thought of as a two state process, transcription and translation and correspondingly you can write down uh, a very simple stochastic uh, model, the two stage model which was referred to in previous talks as well. Uh, uh, production of mRNAs is a positive process, uh, each mRNA can then degrade or give rise to proteins and the proteins can also be degraded. Okay? So this is the quite possibly the simplest model you can write down for transcription uh, for uh, gene expression and uh, even though it is so simple it has been widely used 
and remarkably it makes some simple predictions uh, which are validated by experiments. So one of them is geometric bursts, the number of uh, 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 proteins created by an mRNA uh, before it degrades is a geometric distribution that's been validated by several experiments. Um, so what is remarkable is that even though this is uh, such a simple model, uh, arguably the quantity that is of greatest interest, uh, so you're interested in say the protein distributions, right, the time dependent protein distributions or the steady state protein distributions and finding analytical expressions, exact analytical expressions for the protein distributions was a challenge for a long time, okay, even though this is the most basic model. So, so this is one problem when it comes to, uh, again, as, as was alluded to Romain's talk, taking the full problem, uh, it becomes a little complicated. So, uh, so that's one problem. Even the simplest coarse grain model can be hard to handle. I will talk about this. Uh, the other problem is uh, when physicists write down models of gene expression, simple models of gene expression, this is what we write down. And then again, as we've seen, uh, when biologists write down, this is a simple model of gene expression, okay? In particular, uh, what is clear is that you cannot just sweep post-transcriptional regulation under the rug. There are multiple steps uh, involved in this and in general you cannot expect to replace all of these steps by a single step out here. So we need to have models that take into account the complexity and the um, uh, uh, importance of post-transcriptional regulation. So that's uh, one thing we want to do. And secondly, again, as we've learned in the uh, previous talks, gene expression is a bursty process. So uh, in general, when you actually observe expression uh, from a promoter, uh, you see that there are long periods of inactivity and then short periods of uh, large amounts of activity. And there are different models by which uh, such bursts are produced. Quite possibly the simplest model is this so-called three-stage model. So the previous model was a two-stage model. I would call this a two-stage model. And um, uh, this model is a three-stage model of gene expression where the promoter toggles between uh, repressed and active states uh, and only when it's active it can produce mRNAs with some rate and the rest of it is the same, right? So in appropriate limits you can see that uh, when k on is small compared to this km and k, k off, uh, the activity from the promoter will be characterized by long periods of inactivity, then short periods of a lot of activity where you produce a geometric distribution of mRNA bursts uh, as is observed experimentally, okay? So when you have transcriptional bursting, then this model and others will predict that uh, the mRNA burst distribution is a geometric distribution. Furthermore, when you look at proteins, again, as we learned very nicely in Romain's talk, uh, you, you can do a reduction where you can, uh, in many cases, where you can uh, focus on the mRNA dynamics, which is fast. So assuming that the mRNA lifetime is small compared to the protein lifetime, you can ask how many proteins does mRNA produce before it degrades? And again, the answer is it's a geometrically distributed burst of proteins. So when you actually observe proteins, it appears as if you have no activity, you create an mRNA, you have a geometric burst of proteins over the mRNA lifetime, and then you know it decays slowly, again there's another burst, and so this is what dynamics looks like uh, at a protein level. And so we'll use this to um, uh, develop approximations. Okay, okay. so with that background, uh, I now want to talk about the uh, uh, different, uh, the three different things I'll be uh, discussing today. Uh, the first level, as we saw, even for the simplest coarse grain models, uh, we don't have exact results for generating functions. And I'm going to show you a way we can uh, address this uh, and a nice trick that we have developed to uh, obtain exact generating functions or exact results for generating functions. Uh, moving ahead, we want to include complexities based on bursting and promoter-based regulation. So this is in response to Steve's question, what if the statistics of the arrival time distribution is not simply exponential, but in fact it's something different. So we'll see how that can be addressed uh, within the framework that we've developed. Uh, and then more generally, I want to look at a general class of stochastic models. And what can we say about uh, the probabilities of rare events, in particular large deviations in gene expression? Uh, because uh, so far the focus has been on uh, the mean and the variance, but as we see that these are really rare events that are driving it. So we need a framework for uh, calculating the probability of rare events, understanding how these rare events arise. Okay? So I'm going to begin with uh, first the simplest models and how we can actually obtain uh, exact generating functions. Okay. 
So, uh, so I want to begin with the observation that um, at the mRNA level, okay, uh, obtaining distributions, steady state distributions for mRNAs for the two state and three state model is fairly straightforward. Okay, uh, so again, as we've learned, you you have a master equation, you look at the generating function for it, then for the two state model, you have simple Poisson process. Um, creating mRNAs and mRNAs also degraded with the constant rate. So it's straightforward to show that the steady state distribution is the Poisson distribution with this generating function. What is, the, what is N correspond? N is the number of uh, mRNAs created, number of cellular macromolecules created. So it could be proteins or mRNAs, whatever you want. Which is it? Uh, in this case, it's mRNAs. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm talking about mRNAs uh, throughout this slide, but I will be, uh, okay. So, so in this case, uh, yeah, you're looking at the number of mRNAs at time t and at in the steady state, you get a Poisson distribution for the two-state model. For the three-state model, a little bit more work, but again, it was shown in the early 90s by uh, Yikarth and Peku that the corresponding uh, generating function for mRNAs in the steady state is given by the Kummer function. Okay. So, uh, so this is the generating function from which you can obtain the probability distribution. Okay. So good. So so we know how to get um, for both of these models. We know how to get mRNA steady state distributions exactly. Okay. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow relate these results to the corresponding results for proteins? Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you a way, a trick by which this is uh, made possible. Okay. So let's take the uh, simplest case where you have again. This is the same model, two-state mRNA model. You have some rate at which some macromolecule is produced. It's degrading. And what I'm going to do is, if I write down the master equation, I'm going to break it down into n independent identical processes, okay? And straightforward to show from the master equation that uh, each process corresponds to a reduced arrival rate of uh, the cellular macromolecule. So if I have random variable corresponding to this molecule A, then I'm writing this random variable as a sum of n independent identical random variables and each of these IIDs actually corresponds to uh, the identical master equation but the arrival rate scaled by factor k by n. Okay? So, uh, so this I can do and now what I am going to do is I am going to take the limit n goes to infinity okay? as physicists are wont to do. Uh, what that does for me is the following. Uh, if I now look at some time t okay, in the long time limit because this n is arbitrary and I take n goes to infinity, I know that the number of arrivals of each of type of this uh, mRNAs is going to be up to time t is a Poisson distribution, drawn by Poisson distribution with mean kt by n. So in the limit that n goes to infinity, m having more than one arrival is going to be of order 1 over n squared or worse. Okay? So I can ignore that and I can just focus on either 0 arrivals or 1 arrival up to time t. So in that case, what happens is that I have a simple uh, uh, Bernoulli random variable, and uh, but I have n of these, okay, in the limit that n goes to infinity. So now I can ask the number of mRNAs is simply the number of ones that I have, right? Number of arrivals that I have uh, at time t, and that's clearly a Bernoulli random variable. If I have n of these, I get a binomial distribution, which in the large n limit gives me a Poisson distribution. Okay, so recovering the simple result that we already know. Okay, so that's so far straightforward, but let's see what this does to our problem for proteins. Okay, you have now this two-state protein model for which, mind you, the uh, time-dependent distribution of proteins was an unsolved problem okay, until uh, we uh, managed to solve it uh, using this approach. So, um, so you, this is the same problem. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same trick out here. I'm going to replace the mRNAs by n identical copies of this two-state model. And lo and behold, what we have here is the protein distribution here is mapped on to a reduced model where you are looking at the three-stage model for mRNAs. Okay, so you're looking at the two-stage model for proteins, but that is linked to a kinetic scheme, which is exactly the kinetic scheme for a three-stage model for mRNAs. So that's the link, right? So let me show it more generally here. So more generally, the idea is that you have a Poisson process which governs the arrival of mRNAs. What you can do is you can partition, this is called Poisson thinning, you partition the Poisson process 
into n ind independent identical processes. Okay, so you can think of like every time a mRNA arrives, you put it in one of n types, arbitrary with equal probability, one by n probability. Okay, so the arrival of each type of mRNA, it can be shown as an independent POSA process with rate km by n. Okay, and and so I take the original problem, I map it onto n independent identical problems, and then the reduced problem that I need to solve is much simpler. Okay, in particular, if I look at the two-state model of gene expression. The original model, if I'm interested in the protein distribution, that maps onto a reduced model where uh, I just have to solve this problem, which I already know how to solve. And so you can obtain protein distributions from mRNA distributions for a different model. Okay, so applying this procedure, you know, uh, if g of zt is the generating function for proteins in the this model then that's related to the generating function for proteins in the reduced model in this particular way in the limit that n goes to infinity okay just because of n independent identical copies i can write it in this way but this result i already know now in the steady state but also in the time dependent case so this is already a known result and when i plug that in i get the exact result for the generating steady state generating function for proteins in the two state model so this was first obtained by uh, Powell Books and collaborators where they took a different approach. They calculated all the factorial cumulants, they stitched them all together and they obtained a different expression for it. But uh, our expression that we get is equivalent to their expression and you know it just uses the mapping and uses known results. Okay. So but not only this, we can now do uh, solve the problem of the time dependent protein distribution. So, uh, so we can get an exact expression for the joint distribution of mRNAs and proteins and also uh, for the time dependent protein distribution using this approach. Okay. Um, and we can extend it to not just the simplest model but for further extensions uh, of the two state model. Okay. In particular, uh, what is relevant uh, actually to a lot of talks that presented uh, in this conference is that we can look at cases of post transcriptional regulation. Okay, so you look at this example here, you create an mRNA, the mRNA can give rise to a protein, but it can also toggle through multiple internal states and each state may have its own production rate of proteins. Okay, so this would be like a canonical uh, simple generic model of post transcriptional regulation and the idea is that you can, as long as there is no feedback, uh, you can take this arrival process, partition it again and look at the reduced model which is often easier to analyze and uh, and as we'll see what happens when you do this mapping is that a model for post transcriptional regulation of proteins reduces to a model of promoter based regulation of mrnas so this is exact mapping between a different model for promoter based regulation of mrnas and a model for post transcriptional regulation of proteins given that mrnas arrive constitutively according to a posa process Yeah, I'm looking at the marginals right now. I, uh, but I think the joint distribution also can be done with the, so for the... In other words, is it exact or is it not exact? Yeah. No, this is exact. Whatever I'm discussing is exact. Now for this, for this particular case, right, I actually deleted the slide because it's getting a bit too mathematical. But uh, um, for this case, uh, I, can, uh, I can get the joint distribution also of mRNAs and proteins. Um, uh, but so far, I've been focusing mostly on the marginal protein distribution because that's the quantity of greatest interest. Um, but uh, uh, so I've not thought about uh, the more general cases. Um, uh, but uh, at least, uh, as I recall, uh, for the simple two-state model, we can get not just the uh, marginal for the protein or marginals for the mRNAs, but also the joint distributions. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so what do I mean by promoter-based regulation? So this is actually work and we will see maybe some, some of this in Sandeep's talk tomorrow perhaps because this was work done by uh, Yanni Kondev's group. Uh, Sandeep is uh, uh, again a, a prominent member of the group. And uh, 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 so, so what they showed was if you take a general model of the promoter in which DNA can exist in several possible states, each promoter state has its own production rate of mRNAs then they develop a general procedure for calculating moments of mRNA distributions. Okay? And this is very nice because what we can now do is take our model of post-transcriptional regulation 
like the model shown out here. In fact, it was very interesting because in yesterday's talk, we learned that maybe the mRNAs can toggle between transcriptionally active and transcriptionally inactive states, right? So that is something that uh, can readily be modeled out here where you have uh, inactive state here and an active state here, right? Uh, and so this would be a model of post-transcriptional regulation. With our mapping, what it, what it does is it maps onto this kind of promoter-based model where you have uh, off state, then with some rate, you're toggling to this state. And because you can only have one arrival, you can think of, uh, you, you never have more than one arrival. So the mRNA, once it arrives, it goes through its stages and then it comes back and you can neglect the probability of more than one arrival. So you have a promoter-based model of mRNAs effectively, uh, which maps onto this model. And so if I know how to do this model, I know how to do the general model as well. Okay, I can obtain moments and everything else. And, and this, as I said, is already been solved uh, by Yanni Kondev's group. Um, and it's actually nice because, in fact, you can show with the mapping that the FANO factors, the uh, variance upon mean, uh, are the same for the original and the reduced models. So I can just focus on the reduced model if I'm interested in the FANO factor and obtain that. Okay, so you can do it quite generally. I mean, you can have a general uh, process where you have arbitrary number of uh, steps in between and um, uh, the mapping works. Uh, furthermore, uh, what is interesting is we can now generalize to the case of mRNA bursting. Okay, so I've talked to you so far about constitutive production of mRNAs. mRNA arrival is a POSA process. Uh, but as we've seen, uh, there are several cases in which uh, you can basically say that mRNAs are not arriving at a constant rate, but in fact, they're created in bursts, okay? So it is often useful to consider models in which mRNA production occurs in bursts. So when that happens, uh, you're, you're still interested in the combination of bursting and post-transcriptional regulation, right? To control uh, gene expression variability. And with this map, with the extension of this mapping, what we could show is this very interesting result. I can take an arbitrary burst distribution uh, drawn from any distribution if I want to now calculate the FANO factor uh, for uh, protein product, protein uh, levels in steady state uh, for that arbitrary mRNA burst distribution, okay, given that mRNA production is occurring with some arbitrary burst and then each mRNA that's created in the burst goes through this multiple internal states with post transcription regulation. So I can relate that to the FANO factor I can calculate for a single mRNA burst and for two mRNA bursts. So you just need results for one mRNA burst and two mRNA bursts. Once you have that, you can obtain the FANO factor for arbitrary burst distributions. And this is again an exact result which you will show. So that's an example out here where you have a single mRNA burst where you go from state zero to one to some state internal state two back to zero with this scheme. If you have a two mRNA burst, the promoter scheme is more complicated. You go, you know, you create um, um, two mRNAs and then each one can then go to state two independently, they can both go to state two together. So you get this kind of a more complicated promoter scheme, but ultimately it's still a scheme of promoter based regulation, which we know how to deal with. So uh, so the results for one fa a single mRNA burst and for two mRNA bursts can be obtained uh, readily and that's uh, um, then can then be combined using this exact result to get it for arbitrary burst distributions. Okay, uh, so now I want to move on to, uh, uh, you know, what if the arrival time distributions are not purely exponential distributions, but in fact, if the statistics is different, how does that affect noise in gene expression? Okay, so how do we address that? So uh, one of the things we realized was that queuing theory offers a very natural framework for uh, addressing such problems. And so queuing theory is basically the mathematical theory of waiting lines. You know, you, you just go wait in line for a queue. Uh, and originated with um, uh, the work by Erlang and, and others. Uh, the motivation was actually just telephone lines. And it was, I think, uh, I, I don't know how true this is, but it was said that uh, when telephone lines were, telephone were first uh, invented, then they, they had, they connected the receiver to the sender. They had lines connecting receiver to sender. And then as soon as the number of su subscribers grew to three or more, they realized this was not a feasible connection to have <laughs> connections between every server and every receiver. And so you had to have this concept of servers which receive calls and then you know uh, route them. Uh, and that was the origin of the discipline of queuing theory. <laughs> so queuing theory was born. 
Uh, and basically what queuing theory deals with is a process in which you have customers like arrive according to some random process. You know, you pick up your phone, decide to call your friend. So there's some random process governing customer arrival and then you stay in the queue for some time, for some random time and then you leave. Okay. So it sounds very mundane, uh, but this is the basic thing. So uh, both the arrival and service processes are stochastic processes, but it turns out that really a wide range of applications, you know, primarily in engineering, tele-traffic engineering, of course, but even uh, when the internet was designed, the protocols, right, they, uh, the, a lot of queuing theory was used in this. Uh, so a lot of applications in engineering actually use queuing theory. Uh, and so we realized that maybe we could also use it to model the stochastic arrival and departure of cellular macromolecules, okay. Um, so, um, so now let's take a more general model of gene expression where the arrival time distribution can be arbitrary, okay? And then each, uh, and then every arrival corresponds to some random burst of mRNAs. Each mRNA through some post-transcriptional process can give rise to a random burst of proteins. And then we can even take the protein degradation time distribution to be arbitrary, okay? So very general model. Uh, okay, this is very hard to deal with, but again, as we learned in uh, uh, Romain's talk, we can do a reduction and so, I'm doing this more phenomenologically. It's been shown for the simplest models, but uh, in general, on physical grounds, uh, we can assume that if the mRNA lifetime is short compared to the protein lifetime, then you can basically integrate over the mRNAs and just say that every time mRNA is created, it gives rise to a burst of proteins with some burst distribution. And so you can write down the evolution equation for proteins alone. Okay. Uh, so that's the level at which I'll be looking at things. And the connection to queuing theory as follows. So you have proteins are the analogs of customers in a queue. Uh, the bursty synthesis of proteins corresponds to batch arrival of customers. So instead of customers arriving one by one, if proteins are arriving in instantaneous bursts, that's like customers arriving in batches okay, of random size. Um, and then the lifetime of protein is basically the service time for customers. So proteins are degraded. I mean, so customers are served, proteins are severed, but ultimately it's the same thing, right? The, they leave the system. Uh, and then uh, I'll be looking at models where each protein is degraded independently of the other. So no competition effects. And that in the queuing language maps on to what is called an infinite server queue. So every time a protein arrives, it immediately meets a server who is processing the degradation of the protein. Okay. Okay. So um, so then we look at uh, two particular effects. Um, these have been Johan Paulson's group has named them gestation and senescence. So gestation means that the arrival time distribution is not a simple waiting time distribution, exponential waiting time distribution, but more general. And then uh, senescence means again the death of the, the decay of the protein is not a single step process, but can involve multiple steps. Okay, so, wait, oh uh, yeah, so uh, this is important. So, so basically our model maps on to what is known in the queuing literature as a GIX, G infinity queue, G for general arrival process, X for burst distribution, so arrival in batches, not singly, G for general departure process, and infinity stands for infinite server queues. So we can use then the uh, toolbox in queuing theory to actually look at our general model. And this is the exact expression for the noise in protein distributions given a combination of all these effects. Okay? So you can see now there are combinations of effects from translational bursting, the, the protein burst distribution produced by a single mRNA, transcriptional bursting also. And that adds to a term which we call the gestation factor. And this is what relates the waiting time distribution of uh, arrival to the overall noise in protein distribution. So, it, so it's a bit complicated, it depends upon the Laplace transform of the waiting time distribution evaluated at a particular value. But uh, the message here is, if you give me a kinetic scheme for the process, I can calculate the waiting time distribution for the arrival, that's straightforward. And then once I know that, I can calculate how it affects the noise in gene expression. Okay? So this is again exact. And uh, what's interesting is that if you now look at uh, these two effects, gestation and senescence, then the arrival time distribution acts additively. So, so you have these sources of noise and then the arrival time distribution also adds additively. But uh, 
the decay process actually is multiplicative in this term. So you can actually by tuning the decay process by maybe appropriately choosing the uh, decay process, you can tune the noise, amplify it, but as well as reduce it. Uh, okay, so so in general, for general kinetic schemes using these uh, approaches, we can now look at you give me a kinetic scheme as long as the assumptions made here are valid. Uh, you can plug it in here and figure out how it affects the noise in protein distributions. Okay. Okay. So now let me uh, move on to uh, how much time? Yes. Ten minutes, right? Okay. Okay. That's good. Okay. So yeah. So let me move on to uh, uh, the large deviations part, right? The uh, the rare events. Okay. So let me start with the motivation first. So in fact, um, um, uh, this this figure is taken by uh, uh, research from the group of Heinrich Boger, who was supposed to be here. Uh, but uh, so what what they have shown is that um, um, uh, in general the promoters can be quite complex you know depending on nucleosome occupancies uh, and they can toggle with multiple uh, states uh, multiple internal states so these are all uh, this is the kind of promoter models they deal with and can be more complicated than this um, and what um, Mike Elowitz group has shown is they're interested in given that the promoter can exist in different configurations what is the rule what is the role of epigenetic modifiers okay if i take an epigenetic modif uh, modifying uh, modifier some enzyme that's epigenetic modifier how does that affect dynamics of expression from the promoter and so so they looked at it at the single cell level and what they found is that in fact um, epigenetic modifications affect promoter transition rates so these rates of transition between different promoter states are impacted by different epigenetic modifications in different ways. Okay, so an intriguing question is: we know from previous work that these epigenetic changes are also correlated with rare events that drive phenotypic variation. If you take away some of those epigenetic modifiers, you can actually stop uh, some of these rare events from occurring. So, uh, so a natural question is: how does promoter switching rates? How do they impact rare events in gene expression? Okay, uh, in particular, we're looking at um, uh, production rate from a given promoter. Okay, so we're going to take a very general model to address this question, uh, and this is again in queuing parlance. Uh, this is called the batch Markovian arrival process. Uh, so here's the promoter model that we have. We have n promoter states. Uh, n can be arbitrary. There are arbitrary transition rates. So a i j is the rate of transition from j to i. Okay. In each promoter state i you have some production rate, uh, Ki, at which mRNA bursts are produced, and then you can create some burst distribution. So every time you have a arrival, that creates a burst of mRNA is drawn from some arbitrary distribution. Okay, so this is a very general model, and you know, again, without feedback, most models can be sort of encompassed in this framework. And the idea is that what we want to do is for this general model, we would like to be able to um, say something about rare events when it comes to the rate of production output from this promoter, okay? uh, whether it's mRNAs or proteins. Uh, and because the idea is that these rare events are what drive uh, phenotypic, potentially drive phenotypic switching. Okay, so, uh, so a framework for approaching this problem is using large deviation theory. And in fact, as a physicist, I would like to argue that maybe the first instance of this was by Einstein, Einstein's 1910 paper uh, where we argued that you can think of entropy as a rate function for specifying the probability of a macro state. Okay, so, so entropy is seen as an analog of a rate function, but this was actually taken up by mathematicians later in the 1930s, driven by actuarial concerns. Actually, insurance companies were very interested in the question, uh, and so Escher and then Kramer came up with the realization that these rate functions that you have uh, that are of interest uh, uh, can be derived from the cumulant generating function. So the, so the cumulant generating function holds the key to getting the rate function. And in its mature form, it was developed by Donsker and Verdan, where they actually took these results for IIDs and then generalized it to for Markov processes. Okay? So that's uh, so in recent years, uh, uh, donsker verdan theory has been very fruitfully employed in non equilibrium statistical mechanics to you know, derive a host of results uh, that are of interest. 
And our, so our plan is to actually use this framework to now look at gene expression models. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm. So so that, again, the idea here is that you have. Um, um, if you look at the rate of production of a given promoter, it will have this large deviation form. So in the in the long time limit, you have a rate function, and this is the rate function that you are interested in. So the way to approach this rate function is to look at the scale cumulant generating function. So uh, I apologize. This should be a. Uh, m times t out here, okay? So or or capital M. So uh, so this is slide. But if you take the uh, generating function corresponding to the mRNA production and take the log of that divided by one over t, you get what is called. Uh, is it a <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so so you get the scale cumulative generating function, which is the analog of free energy. And the rate rate function is actually the analog of entropy in statistical mechanics. But the uh, nice thing is that this framework actually applies even for things out of equilibrium. So you can take non-equilibrium, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-equilibrium steady states, for example, and uh, uh, you can still uh, the same framework carries through. So if you want to obtain the scale cumulant generating function, and I'm going to go over it quickly in the interest of time. So you can write down the master equation for this n promoter model. In terms of these D matrices, these specify transitions where the index below refers to the number of arrivals. You can have n arrivals or zero arrivals. So it's straightforward to write down the master equation. For the entire process, we have an infinite dimensional generator because you can have zero at any step, zero, one, two, arbitrary number of arrivals. So this is the generator for the BMAP model for the number of arrivals. And the way we approach large deviations in um, non uh, from the non equilibrium stack uh, approach is that you look at what is called a twisted generator. Okay, so the twisted generator is basically the same as the original one with some modification. And what we were able to show is that once you take the twisted generator and you derive a matrix, a one n by n matrix. So the original matrix is infinite dimensional, but you derive a n by n matrix from the twisted generator by adding up all the matrices all the dn matrices for the twisted dn matrix then the scale cumulant generating function is actually given by the largest eigenvalue of this matrix okay so given a n that n promoter n promoter states we have a n by n matrix we can define which will for a given um, uh, which will control the scale cumulant generating function and here is the simplest one for the two state model two promoter states 0 to 1 with simple transitions and already you see something interesting here if I look at the limit that beta goes to zero, the scale cumulant generating function actually shows a kink. Okay, so it shows discontinuous behavior, which would be the analog of a dynamic phase transition. Okay, because this is uh, where the free energy is changing in a uh, uh, non-analytic way. Uh, and you see that also uh, in the rate function, where for the simple model that we showed previously, uh, as as I vary the parameters. Uh, the rate function pretty much stays Poissonian, but once I go past the critical point, you start to see deviations from the Poisson distribution when it comes to the um, uh, fluctuations, fl probabilities of rare events. So what we have is we have um, um, actually evidence for, under some conditions, for some regions of parameter space, as you look at rarer events, so as you make events rarer and rarer, there is a there can be a qualitative change in the fluctuations that most likely give rise to the rare event. Okay, the changes qualitatively, and so that's something that we are exploring right now. Um, I want to also quickly talk about um, um, something that's even more interesting. So it's not just that we can get the probabilities of rare events; we can also see what is the most likely way the rare event arose. Okay, so this is uh, uh, by looking at something called the driven process uh, in non-equilibrium statmec. And the idea is you're looking at, um, so the original process, you're interested in the original process, but you want to condition it on a rare event. Okay, So you have a population of cells, but I'm only interested in those cells which are expressing proteins at a much lower rate. I don't care about the rest of the population. I want to sample from this limited population. Okay, How can I do that? And uh, so using this framework, you can derive a process, another Markovian process, which has the same statistics as the original process conditioned on the rare event. Okay, so it turns out that you not only need the dominant eigenvalue, but you also need the dominant eigenvector. And uh, using that, we can actually get the driven process, which you know tells you the statistics of the original process conditioned on the rare event. 
So using that approach, we've actually been able to get exact results for this general gene expression model for the driven process. So if I want to give you a gene expression uh, from a promoter and I ask, okay, here's a rare event I'm interested in, what is the most likely way this rare event arose? Or how can I sample uh, protein and mRNA statistics conditional on this rare event? Well, you just have to look at the analytical results we have, which tell you how to get the driven model, which will have the same statistics as the original one conditioned on the rare event. Okay? So I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip up, uh, the uh, results for uh, uh, RNAs and conclude with the summary. So I've shown you that uh, this trick that we have of partitioning POSO arrivals, uh, this can lead to exact results for generating functions for simple constrained models. For more complicated models where you know there's no hope of getting exact uh, uh, analytical results, uh, we can use the mapping to queuing theory uh, to actually get results for moments and see how different regulatory mechanisms can combine to give you the noise in gene expression. And then I'm excited about this uh, results for uh, large deviations, applying application of large deviation theory to gene expression models, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, looking at the implications for possible epigenetic control of rare events. So we, we look at uh, different epigenetic mechanisms. You could go to different regions in parameter space. And as we have learned, in different regions of parameter space, you can have possible uh, dynamical phase transitions. Okay, so that's something that I'm interested in pursuing. I didn't get to talk about it, but uh, I'm also interested in looking at uh, how post-transcriptional regulation impacts the probability of rare events. Okay. So I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I should uh, acknowledge the, my collaborators with whom I've done all this work. So the large division work was done primarily with Jordan Horowitz, who is now a faculty member at UMass uh, University of Michigan. Neeraj Kumar also has uh, contributed to large division work, and uh, he's, he's a postdoc at UMass Boston in my group. Uh, theory commentary, theory platini, who is now at commentary, was and Hojat were involved in uh, the earlier work on the partitioning of POSA arrivals. And again, these are some of my other collaborators. My graduate Tao Jia, who also contributed the post transcriptional work, who is now in China. Okay. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Arun. We have time for one question. So usually associated to rare event, uh -huh. associated to rare event, uh, it is important to have also a notion of time scale. How long it takes for those rare event to happen? I think. And so usually without this time scale, it's very hard. It's very hard to say that those rare event do really matter because mm -hmm. you know the cells after some time they can go to another type, uh, another cell cycle. That's so right. have you looked into mm -hmm. the question of, of how long? What is the typical time scale for this rare event to happen according to your parameter space? Okay, so that's not something we have looked into, but we can do it fairly easily. So uh, clearly the time scale has to be large compared to the time scales of the dynamics, basically, right? And um, we can do this. We can actually simulate the process and we have analytical results for the rate function. So we can simulate for different time scales and see sort of how the results for the rate function approach the limiting value. So that's something that we can do, but we haven't, we've just, this are recent results, so we haven't actually explored that angle, but that's a good question. Because you can calculate, you can calculate these time scales. Calc uh, so, so I mean, I'm looking at... Of rare events using uh, probably, uh, I mean, associated equations. Right, so, so, okay, so there are two aspects here, right? One is, the rare event I'm interested in right now is actually waiting in the long time limit and looking at the rare event correspond to the rate of production, okay? But you can also look at rare events in first passage time distributions, and that's something that has been done and uh, something that actually I'm interested in as well, but I'm not looked into it yet. And Rahul, I guess I'm, uh, yeah, overstepping yeah. the bounds by asking another question, <laughs> <forbidden> <laughs> one. but you know, it's, it's important, I guess, to have analytical formulas, but I guess one main advantage of having analytical formulas as solutions to master equations would be to write out likelihoods right. in such a way as to analyze data, such as uh, Arjun Raj's you know, RNA fish, for example. That's right. So I think there's some value to computing reduced moments or FANO factors, mm -hmm. but I think the greatest strength might be in being able to set up computationally cheap likelihoods. And I wonder if this is a direction that you're, that you're hoping to go in. I'm, I'm hoping to persuade one of my more computationally inclined students to actually go down that path. In fact, you're absolutely right. So it's not just Arjun Raj data, right? Sunny Z has obtained actually beautiful data on protein and mRNA distributions. And what they used to then infer from the data 
is they look at gene expression but in a limiting case just in the case in which you have geometric bursts arriving at a constant rate and they infer gene expression parameters right this is not in general valid when the mrna lifetimes are not very short compared to protein lifetimes so we have the more general result and if we can now use that to look at the data and figure out in what cases are the inferred values accurate what because they're not accurate that's uh, that's one way um, i'm also actually i was hoping to catch jonathan chubb uh, but I'll, I'll maybe touch base with him because um, uh, there is interesting data that he has which can also be used and so that's certainly direction we are planning to go to go in yeah yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> Yeah. Uh, regarding his question, so are, are you aware about this uh, theory on uh, uh, Poisson representation? So actually, in all yeah. these processes, yeah. as long as it's first order or zero order reactions, yeah. you know, it's going to preserve this Poisson structure. Yeah. Yeah. And so another way of interpreting your result on generating function yeah. is like the stationary distribution of the protein mm -hmm. is a compound composition of a Poisson Perfect. and the random variable of the uh, yeah. mRNA. Yeah. Perfect. So Perfect. it's not completely exact. I mean, it's not completely analytical because you don't. You cannot really compute this kind of convolution yeah, yeah. or composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's really useful to simulate it. So so you yeah. can use it then as a likelihood because it's very fast to to compound two random variables. So you draw a random variable yeah, and then you yeah. do a Poisson of this random variable. Yeah. And this Poisson structure is really helpful to yeah. So to yeah. simulate. So I, I think that's a great comment. In fact, it's something that I am uh, looking into. So so just to provide some background, uh, uh, Ramon Roman was referring to something called a Poisson ansatz, which uh, I think was first introduced by Gardiner, right? The, the book on stochastic processes. And uh, the idea is, again, you can write down the steady state distribution as a compound random variable with a, and, and then, so, so it turns out that you can actually um, uh, use that approach uh, to all of these models, including the three state model, which is currently unsolved, okay? And so you can write down, um, um, uh, and you can try to derive now expressions for, so, with um, uh, with Gardiner's case, it's an answer. I mean, you can s motivate it, but you put it, and then you actually derive the equations for this. But we can show using a generalization of this approach how we can actually derive what the mixing distribution is for, for first principles, and uh, and that's something we are actually looking into. We're probably going to uh, write up a more general this uh, you know applications, but that's very much on the cards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.